Hi friends, welcome to this very special episode of Her Empire Builder. Today I have, oh my gosh, the most incredible guest, um, part of my dream 100 list of podcast guests that honestly I sent the email going, I'm not going to hear back from this. And then he said yes. It was like, <laughs> um, and we've just done it in person. Um, and it's absolutely phenomenal. It is way longer than what our normal episodes are, but we couldn't cut any of it because it's all just so good. So we're talking everything from business and life and entrepreneurship and money habits, minimalism. There's some weird things in there, some different things in there, some fascinating things in there. And I hope that it will help you to question the beliefs that you have around business and life. So if you haven't seen Derek Sivers before, uh, he sold CD Baby for $22 million a while ago. He's sitting right there. <laughs> Um, and put it all into a charitable trust and now lives a very minimalist life being an author and is based out of New Zealand. So I hope you enjoy this chat as much as I did. Okay, welcome, Derek Thank you. Sivers. See, we're beginning just like that. I know. No intro. Hello. I'm doing a little <laughs> bit of a happy dance. I'm going to intro you later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you don't know why I first asked you to come on the show today. So I want to share that with you first, because I, I kind of alluded to it just before, um, is one of the things that I did when I started my podcast five years ago was I made a dream 100 list of like 100 guests that I would love to have on my show. And there are people that I'm like, you can't just pick up the phone and say, oh, hi, Derek Sivers, I'm Tina Tower from nowhere. <laughs> Will you come and talk to me? And so I've been waiting to go, I've got to like have some invisible line that I need to make it to before I am worthy enough of emailing and asking to come on the show. And this year when it clicked over, I was like, this is the year. I'm just going to start and ask the people on my dream 100 list to come on. And you were my first one and you wow. said yes, which you, I'm so happy for. You want me to help with the rest? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, some of them you might know. So, I mean, Celine Dion is on there. <laughs> I'll ask her. She's having a little trouble these days, but she, you know. Yes, I have some very obscure ones of just yeah. people that I'm like, I want to ask all of the questions and have interesting conversations with. So thank you for being the first one. You know what's really cute? My kid, uh, who's 12, asked me just last week, he said, you know famous people, right? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I mean, but do you know like everybody? And I said, well, <laughs> depends who. And he goes, I mean, you don't know Bill Gates, right? I said, Actually, I met him twice. <laughs> I said once in the men's bathroom at the TED conference. As you do. And, uh, and another time at a bar in LA when like, our, and he's like, you're serious, you met Bill Gates? And so because that was the first one he asked, yeah. now he has the impression I really know yeah, everybody. Yeah, know everybody. Yeah. What was Bill Gates like? Oh, just. Yeah, yeah and yeah. on with it. Yeah. 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 Um, We're not friends. Okay, so the reason, <laughs> <laughs> caveat, um, the reason why you made it to my Dream 100 list was the books that we have here. Um, I love them. Well, I'd say I love them all, but the fourth one I haven't read <laughs> because it's not aimed at me, but yeah. you've, you've said read it now, so I will definitely read it later today. <laughs> um, but I love that they're digestible like that. Anything You Want is my absolute favourite. Um, How to Live is probably the most frustrating book that I have ever read, but Th the most thank you. interesting um, in going there. But with with all of the books that you have written and all of the different things that you said, I, I'm not going to quote, I said I should have bought my original book because it's got so many underlines and post-it notes in it. It looks bordering on ridiculous. Um, and I stopped highlighting when I got to the third one because I'm like, it's all just so good that I'm not going to quote any of it except one time, just this one thing. Um, so you wrote in anything you want, most people don't know why they're doing what they're doing. They imitate others, go with the flow, and follow paths without making their own. They spend decades in pursuit of something that someone convinced them they should want without realising it won't make them happy. I read that and was like, so the reason I started reading that was I was at a really pivotal moment in my life where I was going, I don't even know what I want anymore. When people say, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what is your advice on breaking life's rules and living mm. on your own terms if you're going, you know, this direction I want to change. Talking with friends. Um, I think when you, when you realize that 
the way that things are going now are not working for you in some way. Yeah. Whether you're just feeling lost or it's like that feeling of like every door you try to open is locked, you know, yeah. metaphorically. Um, then I often just, I think like how else could I be thinking about this? Like what's another perspective I could take? And even if I need to like put on an alter ego yeah. or ask um, myself, what would this other person think? Like, what would my hero yeah. think? What would this fictional character, what yeah. would, uh, you know, Samurai Jack do? What would, uh, I don't know, pick whatever your fictional hero might be. Whatever it takes for you to think of your situation in another, uh, from another perspective. But then when you find one that you think like, ooh, I like that. You know, that's a new angle I hadn't thought of. I could think this way. Then it's talking to friends for me. Yeah. As I, I call up a friend and I'll say, hey, um, what do you think about this? Like, what if instead of thinking of what I'm doing this way, what if I looked at the whole thing that way? And then a friend um, will help echo this back to you, making it like a social reality. You know what yeah. I mean? So friends do this all the time. Let's, let's just go down to like the most base, like teenage level. Yeah. Like you, you meet a, 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 a boy <laughs> and your friends as a teenager would, would be like, uh, oh my God, that's so good. He is great. You two are perfect together. Oh my God, you look so good together. You're so happy. It's nice. And then uh, two years later or uh, two months later, you break up and your friends are like, yeah, he's awful. <laughs> you were so much better without yeah. him. And so friends already do this. They help echo back a way of looking at something. And that starts to, it takes the, the faint idea and starts to make it feel mm -hmm. real when you get the social like echolocation, yeah. right? Um, and then you, d you talk to another friend, you say, hey, I'm thinking of taking this new approach to what I'm doing. And your friend says, yeah, you know, and if you do it that way, that means that this and that, and you go, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And pretty soon, these all start to feel like realities instead of just an idea. And like sitting in which one you think feels the most comfortable? Yeah, um, not comfortable. Um, Exciting. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on your value system. For some people, yeah, yeah, it would be comfortable. For somebody else, it might be exciting. For somebody else, it might be like, I need to make a real change in my life. Yeah. What's the, what's the viewpoint that feels like the biggest change from how I currently yeah. do things? That's that's what I did after um, after I sold my company. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask you, like, have you had the existential crisis at different points in your life where you're like, how? Like oh, you mentioned before, what got me here won't get me there. Yeah. When you get there and you go, I want to completely throw out every rule that I've lived to by now. Yeah. And let's write a new set. All the time. Yeah. Um, I don't um, talk about it publicly much, but uh, in short, I got into a really bad relationship that has, and then we had a kid together. <laughs> so... Um, so a lot of my <laughs> philosophical uh, deep dives yeah. have come around like how to deal with my situation yeah. and my restrictions in life. I would like to be doing this. Yeah. I am doing this. How, how can I be okay with that? How did you get yourself into that? Come on. The way it, norm <laughs> the way it normally happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was hot. Um, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was distracting. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's so many times, whether it's like financially or it's not something in your personal life yeah. takes a major change, or you just, you're feeling like done or stuck. Yeah. And you think, all right, I need to make a real change. Yeah. So, okay, let's pick a, a, um, a better example. So when I sold my company, yeah. you could say that it was like a success moment. Yeah. But for me, it felt like a failure moment because... The only reason I sold the company is that things had gotten so bad mm. that I sold. It's like the, the I was such a bad the same manager. reason that I sold my company. Really? Yeah. You're the only person I've heard say that. Really? Like, yeah. Yeah. I, by the time I sold my company, I couldn't remember a day where I didn't feel nauseous or had a headache. Wow. And I probably didn't have a week without crying for a year wow. beforehand. Yeah. I hmm. built a beast okay. that was 
wrong way, go back, and I couldn't go back. Wow, yeah. and that's why you sold, all right. And that's why I sold, yeah. Huh. And then people say, congratulations, yeah. and you go, oh, thanks, I'm like, I guess. yes. But I mean, it's helped now. I've right. built a beautiful company now yeah. that doesn't have all of those things. But mm. this is not about me. This is about you. So. <laughs> well, no, this is nice to hear. So that... you got the um, when you sold CD Baby. Well, so literally the day after I had a deal to sell the company, um, it was my sister's birthday. So it January eighteenth was the day that we had this handshake deal, yeah. and I went to bed with a, like an empty head and a smile that night, <laughs> like whoa done like I am no longer Derek at cdbaby.com yeah. wow how nice the next morning I woke up I was like oh my god my next company I know what I want to do yes. and I like dove into it I started programming it right away yes. called the person I wanted to work for me I was like you want to be the manager of this thing he said yes let's yeah. do it so for three months I started this new thing it was called yeah. muck work and I believed <laughs> in it completely uh, sketched it all out we got three months into it and then I went wait a minute hold on if I do this I'm going to be following the same trajectory I've been on for 10 years already. Yeah. I want to make a real change in my life. Yeah. So, sorry, this has been a long answer to your original no, question. It. Is that I... That's why we're here. I started <laughs> deliberately um, saying no to everything I used to say yes to, saying yes to everything I used to say no to, like deliberately going against my instincts over and over, like sometimes multiple times a day. Yeah. It's like at every turn. To just see how it felt. Uh-huh. Yeah. So honestly, that's that's when you yeah. asked your question. I guess I'm answering two questions at once. You said, how did you get into that relationship? Yeah. Exactly like this. Yeah. I was passing through <laughs> New York City and um, uh, we had been dating for a few months. Yeah. And... Um, she said, oh, well, I, uh, my parents uh, said that w we have to be married if I were to come travel with you. And everything in me said no. So I said yes. Wow. And, you know, it was a good way to shake life up. Yeah. To break your uh, And when you went traveling, habits. did you go wide traveling then? Or was that when you went to New Zealand? No, w went wide traveling first. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, no, New Zealand wasn't until a couple of years later. Um, my son was born when I was living in Singapore. Yeah. And then uh, I just wanted him to grow up in New Zealand. So. Why New Zealand? Nature. Isn't it beautiful? Mm -hmm. I really it do is... think it's one of the most beautiful countries in the world. Probably exactly. the most beautiful country in the yeah. world. Yeah. If you had to We've pick just one. We've got the rain one. pouring down here, which is lovely. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so all the clicking you hear on yeah. this recording <laughs> is the rain. Um, so, uh, yeah. So I think that's what I do. So sometimes the new values you need can just be anything to scramble, scramble your old habits. Yeah. The opposite of whatever you did before. Sometimes your value system might be like, all right, you know what? I've been running too ragged. Mm. I want to take it easy. I've been pushing myself too hard. Yeah. I need to go for a value system now that, uh, or a lifestyle design change that's going to be easy and comfortable. Yeah. But whatever it is, yeah, I do highly recommend, as you can tell, um, journaling a lot uh, yeah. works for me. I spend hours in my journal just kind of turning ideas into reality in my head yeah. and then calling friends, getting that kind of echolocation back from friends helps I love that. make things real. Yeah. How much internal conflict happens for you when you adopt that new belief system that is so different from something that you've carried for a really long time that you no longer want to carry? Hmm. For me personally, um, when something feels unnatural, I feel like I'm on the right track. Really? Yeah, but that's just my weird personal yeah. belief system. Because I, it's like one of my favorite joys in life is um, changing my mind. Yeah. So when I'm reading a book, what I'm hoping yeah. the book is going to do, obviously, is change my mind. That's yeah. why I'd be reading the book, is because I want you to, don't tell me what I yeah. already know. Well, I mean, that's what How to Live definitely does. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, change my mind on something. That's what I'm here for. Like, that's what I want. And so yeah. I feel that in life, too, that I want to try on a new way of thinking. Yeah. That's my greatest So story. before we hit record, we were talking about changing and people changing, because mm -hmm. I pointed out that my Enneagram had changed and you said, do people fundamentally change? It's rare. So with, would you say you change through each of those Ooh. times? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, when somebody asks why I don't make music anymore, yeah, it's like, ugh, uh, I don't know. That was <laughs> that was previously me. Yeah, same name, same uh, bones, but very different soul. Yeah, because I would say 
I mean, I've been with my husband since I was 18. We wow. have our 20th wedding anniversary next year, which wow. I'm very happy with. But I go, we're also, I think it's nothing but luck because I would say he's a wildly different person than when we met. Wow. I'd say I'm a wildly different person. Yeah. But it's like each evolution we've really liked. And that's been nothing but luck in that's the amazing. end. But we talk about it sometimes and go, like, if 10 years ago could see what I do, like, she would have been going, no way. Like, that's not what we do. I've become a lot more introverted hmm. as I've gotten older, which I think I always was, but masked hmm. quite a lot. And I think that's a lot of what we do in our 20s and 30s, that we mask a lot of our natural tendencies to yeah. try and fit in with everybody. Yeah. Um, but what is the biggest thing that you think that, did you ever, did you do that as well? Like when you ran CD Baby and you were going like more and more, I want to conquer the world. Was that in mm. eight? Like, was that in eight? No, I think that actually the, the want to conquer the world thing, um, that was more of my musician years. I was trying yeah. to be a successful, famous musician. Then when I started CD Baby, I felt more like the, um, the metaphor of the, the, the athlete that used to be in the spotlight and is now on the side of the court just being a coach. Yeah, right. So, um, no, CD Baby to me, I was very unambitious. Even um, though the success you had there was probably way more than 99.9% .9 of musicians. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. It, it's, no, I'm saying that, like, my drive was... Like from the very start, like literally uh, three months into starting it, yeah. I realized like, oops, I've started this thing. <laughs> and so I said, okay, well, since I've started this thing by accident, which I didn't want to distract me from my music career, yeah. um, I thought, well, as long as I'm going to do it, I, 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 sorry, I haven't uh, read the book in a while, I'll bet it's in there, but I kind of set this criteria. It's like, well, in a perfect world, the perfect music distribution company would like, look like this. You know? yeah. Give me the full name and address of everybody who buys my music. Yeah. Never allow a paid placement. It's not fair to those who can't afford it. Yeah. Uh, never kick me out for not selling enough, and I want to get paid every week. Yeah. That would be my dream come true as a musician. And I knew that by doing this utopian ideal that I would be limiting the growth of the company. Because if I allowed paid placement, yeah, bring it on, just pay me if you want to be in this yeah. thing, you know, then that would have grown the company bigger. Um, people later came to me and say, hey, as long as you've got this infrastructure in place, you could be selling porn <laughs> and you could make a ton of money. I was like, I don't want to make a ton of money. Like, what do you mean? Wait, what? Yeah. Like, hold on. I think I might have heard you wrong. I said, no, look, I'm not doing this for the money. I'm doing this because I'm making this utopian ideal of yeah. a, a thing that should exist. Yeah. So no, I, I was. I, I think my CD Baby years were very unambitious. Yeah. I was trying to limit the growth. I find that so interesting. You know, I used to hear people say things like that, and mm. I used to think they were lying. Mm. If I ever heard someone say, "I'm not doing it for the money," I'd go, "Yeah, right." Hmm. And now I don't work for the money, mm. but I wouldn't have believed me before. Right. Was that always? Like when you say you wanted to be a musician and you wanted to be successful and famous, did it have anything to do with the money then? No, not the money, no. You never wanted, had the financial goals? No, I don't think so. I think at one point ever, in one early little brainstorming session, probably when I was like 21, <laughs> I think I might have written, you know, a million dollars by the time I'm 30 or something like that. But it was just one of you know, a hundred things I wrote down yeah. when thinking. It was nothing I took very seriously. Yeah. To me, the, the, the dream was always to to be great. It was always what I wanted to yeah. be. In fact, oh, okay. So did you um, ever read any, like Tony Robbins' Awake in the Giant Within? <laughs> yeah. uh, I was like, Tony Robbins, when I was 18, I thought I would be the next Tony Robbins. Right. Yeah. I was um, a damaged teenager. <laughs> I found Tony Robbins, like people uh, find religion, and I was yeah. like, in. Yeah, yeah. Me too. So yeah. <laughs> um, so the thing that bothered me the most yeah. about his message um, was where he goes on and on about the things you want to have. Mm. Where it's like, don't you want to have a castle? Yeah. Don't you want to have a helicopter? Have your own private plane? No. And with everything, I was just like, ugh. Yeah. Oh God, no. Ugh. Yeah. Ugh. It sounds awful. Even as like 17 years old, I was like, no. Oh, see, I thought I did when I read that. Okay. I was like, yeah, you're right. 
Yeah, I do need that. Even okay. this morning, I went onto Facebook and I read in, I use Kajabi as the software for my courses, and I read in their Facebook group someone that had just made $10 million and was sharing their tips. And one of their tips was buy the Ferrari, not the Hyundai, because of the respect you get from people and the people you meet. It doesn't matter if you go into debt. Wow. Because you can pay it off over 40 years. And I was like, oh no, no. But there'll be a lot of people that read that that go, all right, that's what I have to do. And that is one of the main reasons yeah. I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, that needs to be amplified more as yeah. multiple ways of success that doesn't only look like a private. I mean, why would you want a plane, really? Is, is anyone, right. if you're Taylor Swift, I understand. She's flying everywhere yep. for her job. Totally get that. But for yeah. most people, I don't think that that's. Yeah. Necessary. And most people listening to this probably aren't trying to decide whether to get a plane or not. No. But. It can come down to um, God, anything. Ye yesterday I was sitting with a group of people at this event I'm at, yeah. which are a bunch of like millionaire coaches. And, um, and okay, so I'm sitting with this group of five guys and one of them sitting next to me says, uh, hey, do you have a watch? And I went like this, I pulled out my phone. I said, it's a 12, he, and he goes, I know what time it is. I was asking if you have a watch. I said, well, and then, I looked around because he said, you're the only one here without a watch. Like a fancy watch? Yeah. Uh, and I looked around and sure enough, all five guys had fancy ass uh, watches. And I went, why do you, like, I just never really looked at men's wrists. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, why do you all. <laughs> I never looked at men's wrists. I was like, do you not have phones? And he's like, oh, it's not about that, mate. It's about that, you know. And he gave me his thing. He's like. And what was it about? He said. No, it's something, you know, you, you get yourself to say that you've arrived, you oh. know, that once I make this much money, I'm going to get myself a nice watch. He yeah. said, it's like, a, it's like a status, like I've made it. Yeah. I got this watch and I was just like, ugh. I was just sitting there yeah. feeling so alienated. I was like, I've never owned a watch. I can't even imagine why. Do you have any jewelry? On? No. None. But, um, because I get too philosophical about anything. It's like, why would I need a watch? Like, yeah. I would never just go get a watch. I, I think... What would I need that for? Yeah. Okay, for telling. Or, okay, no, it's not about telling the time. It's a piece of yeah. artwork. I was like, well, are there different kinds of artwork I could wear on my body if I wanted to wear artwork? Yeah. Uh, do other people, like, why would I want to wear artwork? Yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, because it will communicate that, why would I want to communicate status? Who would I, would somebody do something for me because I'm communicating status that they would not if I did not? Probably. But are those the kind of people that I would no. want to work with? <laughs> like, who am I trying to attract? Somebody yeah. that would be impressed by a watch? Yeah. I don't like those people. Yeah. And so I, to me, I get too... Um, I'm feeling judged by my watch right now. No, but see, that's, that's a functional... Do you know, watch. I wear this watch purely because I am... I have just decided to hike Mount Kilimanjaro right. in October with my friends as part of our like work for wellness. This ass is currently not getting itself up Mount Kilimanjaro, so I'm really trying to increase my okay. steps. Okay. I'm data driven and I like the data. Nice. It's my defense of my watch. Well, no, see, <laughs> look, if for maybe the other five guys that were standing there with their fancy ass. Yeah. Philip Petit, whatever is yeah. that what it's called? A Petit, anyway, I don't um, know. So, I, I only um, know old school like Rolex. <laughs> Rolex, yeah. yeah. Same thing. Mind you, I did see an ad in the airport and I took a photo of it because I thought it was one of the most beautiful ads I'd seen. That was a watch ad not okay. long ago that was, oh, I can't even remember the words now that I've brought it up, but it was like um, a father and a son and it was the, the watch and it said, what will you pass on to him? And right. it was like that sort of rhetoric. I was like, clever. You're clever. Clever. <laughs> clever yeah. lie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice try. Yeah. Marketing department. But I can department. see how it yeah. worked. Yeah. I was like, I can see men seeing that and going, yeah, I want to pass my watch on to my son. Okay. Yeah. On that note, since we've yeah. totally taken a fun tangent. I know. No, I no, haven't no, even, you know, I'm totally so off my questions. So we can come back to the track anytime we want. Um, I thought, oh God, I, I'm about to reveal uh, something uh, a little embarrassing. So I thought it would be good for my kid to have an EU passport. Yes. To just open up opportunities for him. So there are a few ways to do it. So starting in 2012 when he was born, I tried the first way, which was to become a legal resident of Belgium by incorporating a company in Belgium, spending enough time in Belgium and paying your taxes there for enough time that Belgium will make you a citizen if you've been doing that enough. Yeah. I did that. 
but my immigration lawyer didn't tell me that I had to file a certain form, and suddenly, poof, my Belgium visa was gone. I was like, damn it. And I would have had to start all over again. So I looked for other options. Portugal came up. And so in 2014, I became a legal resident of Portugal. The deal in Portugal is show up for two weeks per year for six years in a row, and after six years, you're eligible for citizenship. Yeah. Um, I go to Portugal every year for six years. Yeah, for sure. Oh, you, oh, you would? You yeah. Said, I thought you did. Okay, so... Yeah. Um, Good deal. So 2014 plus six is... Yeah. Oh, we're at 2020. Oh, no. So with New Zealand, with its closed borders, I couldn't go back on the to last renew... On So after, on my sixth year, when I was finally eligible, uh, that's exactly when COVID began, and oh. New, New Zealand borders were closed for oh. two, two and a half years. So I could have left, but I couldn't have come back. Yeah. And so womp, womp, after six years, my Portugal thing disappeared. So then there's one other option that somebody said. They said, you know, um, in Malta, <laughs> you can... Another beautiful place. You can pay 800,000 euro, so basically a million dollars. That sounds uh, like a green card in America. And um, they will essentially, if you have a good background and you're a good person, they will make you a citizen of Malta. And then that will pass down automatically, not to, only to your kids, but to their kids, whatever. So for a minute, I considered it. And I was talking with a friend of mine. See, I, I like to do yeah. this echolocation thing a lot. So I was like, hey, what if? What would you think if I did this for my kid? And he goes, well, your kid might enjoy having a, an EU passport. And he said... I think he would definitely enjoy having a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, enough said. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. The winning answer yeah. has been reached. So as for the fancy ass Rolex to pass down to your son. Yeah. I was like, yeah. How about the $40,000 yeah. that you would spend on the watch? I think your kid would like $40,000 yeah. better than your Probably. fucking watch that yeah. he did not choose himself. Yeah. So that, you know. Anyway, um, <laughs> this is why I don't have nice things. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about that late, later, but I'm going to try and stay on track. It's okay. very interesting. Like, I, you know, am off track already, but no, that's we can, okay. We can follow whatever tangents you Fantastic. want. Fantastic. Everything you say, I'm like, but what about this? Um, so what does your daily life look like now? Hmm. Because you're still, you're still working, you're working on what you feel like, you're still, you've got your useful, not true. It depends, kind of yeah, I'm, like right now I'm just writing. I mean, I answer emails, yeah. and, but that's just like, you know, half an hour a day. Um, so let me ask about the email mm -hmm, thing. Sure. Because you put your email address in your books mm -hmm. and you say, email me. And I love it. My email box is so wonderful. How do you keep up with that? It's, it's manageable. You know, Is I'm it? not, uh, I'm not a Hollywood star. I would star, expect so. like you're getting hundreds of emails a day. No, I get maybe 50 a day, 50 to 100 Which a day. Which is still a lot of emails. Yeah, but it's, um, most of them are just sweet compliments. Yeah. Um, and you write back to everybody. Yeah. Wow, um, that's cool. But God, sometimes, I mean, my... I don't do social media, yeah. so a lot of the hit that people get from swiping things and yes. scrolling things, it's all in my email inbox. Yeah. So um, I just yesterday got an email from a musician in Turkey that we were having this like interesting philosophical conversation um, about beliefs and choosing beliefs and whatnot, and then the next email was from a writer in Gaza born and raised in Gaza, and um, he had just told me last week, uh, he like introduced himself and said he's a fan of my writing, and uh, and told me more about his life, and then he, I asked something about, oh my God, did you grow up, grew up in Gaza, and how is it now? And he said, well, um, my two cousins, my like childhood friends were, were both killed mm. um, in the war, and um, so far, you know, it's only been, we're only whatever, months into it, and uh, I said, uh, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. That must have been so devastating. And he replied back saying, actually, uh, I had already, my home had already been destroyed and a lot of my friends were killed. And um, so honestly, by the time I got the news that my two cousins had died, I was already pretty numb. Mm. And like we were talking about that. So what do you say to that? Oh, we talked about it. Uh, I don't remember what I said, but like it was, I was just sitting there going, God, I love my inbox. Yeah. <laughs> like this is amazing. 
And, oh, I know what, because in that same email, he was saying, anytime you come to Gaza, he said, please, and he said, he said, let me tell you the better ways to enter now. Go to Jordan first and come in mm -hmm. over, if you're going to the West Bank, come in from Jordan. Or if you want to come see me in Gaza, come in through Egypt. He said, come to my home. We will take care of you. For as long, he said, my, uh, I'm the only one that speaks English in the family, but uh, I've told my mother about you, and she can't wait to make you the best hummus you've ever tasted, whatever. You come mm -hmm. stay with my family. So and beautiful. I'm like, oh, man, I love this. Yeah. I love my English. That must feel incredible to have reach globally. Yeah. I mean, it's one of my favorite things. Yeah. It's why I think it's the reason I'm always giving my email address saying, everybody email me. Yeah. I really love meeting these people. Okay, yeah, the Gaza guy, that's extreme. But yeah. even just meeting like, you know, hey, I'm a swimming instructor in yeah. Vietnam. I'm like, cool. I know a swimming instructor in <laughs> Vietnam. That's so cool. Yeah. And then what I love is that when I go traveling, I, um, I contact these people. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, hey, I'm in Bangalore. Let's meet. Yeah. I'm like, cool. I get to meet up with a bunch of people in Bangalore, India. Yeah. Now I've got friends in Bangalore. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful feeling. I went to, I impulsively, when I lived in England uh, a few years ago, I impulsively was like, I've always wanted to go to Finland. I've never been to Finland. Oh, Finland. I'm going to Finland tomorrow night. Yeah. And because, you know, it was like $30. Yeah. <laughs> and one hour. It's amazing. And so, um, so I popped over to Finland and yeah. arrived at midnight, sent out six emails to six people I know in Finland. And the next day I'm sitting naked in a sauna with a dude from Finland that brought me to his favorite sauna on the coast. I mean, it's what you do in Finland. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was just like, I love this. Yeah. So, yes, that, that's why, yeah. Anybody Having... listening to this, email me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll put it in there. Um, I'm just having all the Finland flashbacks mm. coming through. Magic, magic place. Um, so no social media. Why no social media? I just don't like it. Yeah? It's, it's like, why no reality TV? It's yeah. like... Like once or twice, I would pass by a yeah. one of those reality TV shows. They're like, yeah, flash, 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 edit, yeah. edit, flash, flash, yeah. flash, flash. Yeah. I'm like, ugh, can you? It, so I kind of feel the same way about social media. I just don't like it. Interesting. And you've never felt like you, have you ever felt like you should or that you needed it for something and it wasn't there or you just totally switched off from it? It was invented after I was successful. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't need social media. I mean, uh, every now and then. Okay, like the... the... It's such a good luck. <laughs> it's invented it's, it's after direct. I was successful. I was already there. Um, uh, this event that I'm at with these coaches, people are like the humble dude sitting next to me yeah. makes $20 million a year advising Australian e-commerce businesses on how to optimize their Facebook ads. Yeah, well. Wow. That's all he does and makes 20 million a year doing it, which means they're making more than 20 million a year yeah. doing it. And I'm listening to this going like, I think I need to adjust my um, beliefs. Sometimes if your beliefs are too far from reality, yeah, you know, like, I don't know. I was about Sometimes, to try to... I mean, you know. it's like a dream to drop off the grid. I... I did 90 days without social media. Okay. Like that was that was it when we traveled around the world for a year. Okay. I did 90 days and switched everything off. And it it almost felt like it felt wonderful mm -hmm. was one thing that I was like, I would love to live without social media. Mm -hmm. But there is so much that I think that I would miss business-wise, connection-wise, relationship-wise. Right. So many friends that I have met have been through social media that we've started yeah. out like mutual fans and then become friends yeah. from there as well, that I would miss that part of it. But yeah, the, the constant connection wouldn't miss that yeah. at all. So that's why it seems like, well, if you feel it's important for your business, maybe it would be good for like an assistant to yeah. do that instead of you. But yeah. but on the other hand, like you said, if it's if you've got some pleasure out of it, yeah. especially like personal, if you're not just saying, well, I have to do this for my business. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, so you do, and maybe social media does have a little bit to do with this too. You do keep your head in the clouds somewhat, being able to think the big thoughts and do all your philosophizing. Philosophizing? Sure. What's the word? <laughs> sure. Yeah, why not? Philosophizing. <laughs> Is sure. That a word? I yeah. don't think so. Um, but doing that, how do you keep your head in the clouds and do you succumb to like the daily stresses of life? Oh, that's right. I didn't answer your question about what I do all day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so you it, can I mean, it's the same kind of this. question. Yeah. Um, that, uh, I, yeah, I, I wake up and I write. Um, I mean, okay, so I mean, actually, I mean, I wake up with my son most of the time that, uh, that, you know, either, either he'll jump into my bed at 6 a.m. Or, yeah. or yell for me to jump into it. So we always kind of like cuddle and talk first thing in the morning and just yeah. kind of like talk about life or whatever. And then he goes off to school 
And is he a big thinker too? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, in his own way, yeah. Yeah. He. It's really sweet. He uh, will be out playing, and he'll be like, "Hey, Dad, can we can we just sit down here and talk about life?" I'm like, oh. yes. Then yes. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be wonderful. Um, so, um, but yeah, he goes off to school, and then right now, I'm just trying to write the new the new book. That's yeah. like monomaniacal focus is like, okay, every now and then I, I want to like lift my head up and go, oh, what else could I do? I'm like, no, shut yeah. up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Got to finish this thing. Um, Are you on a timeline for it or no, you just want it done? I just want it done. Yeah. I feel like 10 months pregnant is yeah. my metaphor of just like, get yeah. it out. Yeah. I'm done. Uh, yeah. And, uh, but there are other times. Okay. So say I'm like, once the book's done, then I can imagine throwing myself into another thing. Like say, I'm going to I'm going to make my Sivers.com bookstore be multi-warehouse. Um, yeah. So I'm going to have a warehouse in Germany. That's, I mean, it's already ready to go, but I'm going to have to make it so when you buy my books, it's going to ask you, where do you want it from? And so now I've got to do the coding that's going to manage inventory in multiple locations. It currently doesn't do that. Yeah. And so I know I'm going to be programming for a couple of weeks. I'm going to be programming a thing for the And you still want to do all of that yourself. I enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. I have actually a few times I considered outsourcing it, but I, I really enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so I said, no, this is, this is the thing that I love. It makes me happy. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then I'll just throw myself into that for a while, and then that'll be done. The, the thing I don't like doing is to, like, I'm going to do this for an hour, and this for an hour, yeah. and this for two hours, and then 30 minutes of this. And when I have a day like that, I just feel like, ah, yeah. today sucked. Mm -hmm. And the days that I'm happiest are when it's like I wake up at 6 a.m., and I do one thing all the yeah. way till midnight and I go to sleep and I'm like, oh my God, that was amazing. Yeah. And it was sweet that like, that I've got good friends that I've known for so many years and a few of them have said back to me like, you know, in all the years I've known you, you always do this. The days when you do one thing from mm. like 6 a.m. to midnight are the days that you tell me you were the happiest. Yeah. Like, it's been really consistent through the years. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so now I know that's like, it's a good reminder to to steer my life that way. So one of your questions we kind of hinted at but haven't dove into yet is like making these life decisions. Mm. Like, how do you know what to do? Yeah. It's like, sometimes you just look at your past and you notice things about yourself. You're like, I could do this or this or this, but then it's like, you know what? Every time I do this, I'm really happy. Yeah. And so, yeah. You Follow start that to path. Learn that about yourself, yeah. Do you have, um, like, are you a daily habits person? Like, you've got to wake up and do this and then this and no, then this. I all. used to think, so I read um, Robin Sharma's 5 a.m. Club mm -hmm. book, like, many, many moons ago, and was like, okay, successful people get up at 5 a.m. So I did that, and then I did, like, worked out and did meditation and journaling and all of these things, and I did it for about six months, and I was miserable. I had a headache every day. Wow. I was cranky. And I was like, I can't be successful because I can't do the daily <laughs> You'll habits. never be a success. I'm never going to make it. Yeah. And then realized, actually, I can wake up really slow. And I yeah. can hug my kids in the morning and lay there and chat in bed and then sit on the back deck and just slowly drink my coffee. Yeah. And that's totally fine. Um, so I was curious if you had habits. Not no. at all. Really? Um, none. No, the, uh, I think it's interesting. None? None. None. No. Um, yeah, not a single one. I mean, there's some things that I generally do. I generally like to make a cup of tea in the morning. <laughs> How's that for success? Um, so uh, the key to success. <laughs> generally make a cup Derek, of tea. It says Derek Sivers. Always a good um, idea. No, but you know, the, okay, so in the music business, yeah. there's a beautiful metaphor that, um, or a comparison that they would say for years, you can't be a success in music unless you go on tour. But then, um hip-hop artists would just like release a single with no mm -hmm. tour and it would be like instant smash hit yeah and they, okay well yeah and they say well you can't be a hit unless you're on radio yeah. and then these heavy metal bands would like sell out arenas all the time they've never been on radio in their entire yeah. history you know iron maiden or judas priest or whatever and um and so anytime somebody tells you no 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 here's what you need to do mm. it's like all right that's one way yeah it's not the way but the person saying it believes it's the way yeah uh usually out of self-interest yeah. you know somebody who's involved in the uh in video editing will tell you what you need to have yeah. are well edited videos you cannot be a success yeah. without well edited videos and somebody else will say no no 
the key to it is, is, pub is self-publishing books. Yeah. That's the key to success, you know. Yeah. So every, yeah, anyway. It's probably the, the most difficult thing that I find about being a coach, and I think probably the most frustrating thing about people that work with, the people that work with me would find, mm -hmm. is I don't have the one way. I don't mm -hmm. think there's ever one way. Mm -hmm. I think it's different for different stages and how you want to live and what you want to do and what your natural tendencies are, which can be really frustrating for people. So like, just, just tell me exactly what to do. But there is no exactly what to do. And I think it changes all the time and it should change all the time. Although, okay, so, but I also get this desire, the, the, the just tell me what to do. I often want that for things that I, don't care about that much. Mm. If I really want to nerd out on a subject, then I don't want you to just tell me what to do. I want to like, I want to explore this. Yeah. But for some things, so for me, it was like, um, let's say diet. Yeah. I don't care to read a 900 page <laughs> book about the science of protein. Yeah. I'm not going to read that. Um, just tell me what I'm supposed to be eating. Yeah. Just, just tell me what to do. Yeah, that's true. And, yeah. uh, I don't need a custom diet. Just, just tell me, wake up, make black beans with a chicken breast yeah. like this. That's please. your breakfast? No, no, no. I'm just saying, oh, like if somebody were to tell insight me. Insight into Derek Sivitz. No, 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 no. No, I'm just quickly, like, like say, say, for example, if somebody would say, the, op the optimum diet is for you to just wake and, and eat this yeah. and this and that and twice a week do this, I'd say, okay, thank you. That's all, like, yeah. I, I don't even need to hear your rationale. Yeah. I'm sure you've done, I see your PhD. You're, okay, just, just tell me what to do. So I understand that uh, I did that um, technology-wise when I yeah. wrote this page on my website. There was dozens of hours of my life making this thing called Tech Independence. Yeah, and I very deliberately did the "just tell me what to do" approach because there are unlimited numbers of articles saying, "Well, you know, there are fifteen different hosting yes. companies you could use. There's many different options you can use for software." I'm like, "Okay, here's a path. Yeah, do this go here." Type this at this site, do that, voila. Yeah. Look, you now have a working email server, web server, DNS, calendars, da 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 da. I'm like, there. Yeah. And people say, well, why did you choose that one company to recommend? I'm like, it was just the one. It was just, I, I yeah. know, that, I mean, I've used them, they work, and the whole point was to just pick one. So I do think it's really handy to just tell people what to do. Yeah. For things like that. I was having the, the conversation with Dan, who's videoing us right now, um, before and saying, I need to set up this sort of setup at mm. home. And I was going, I have everything. I have my tripod, my cameras, my screens, the mics, like I've got it all. I don't know how to put it together and I don't know how to make it all work. Like the camera store saw me coming and I was just going, yeah, I need everything for the setup. And then was like, well, I'm like, you should, should like do the process mm. and going, this is exactly what you need, how to set it all together, how to do it. And I just follow it step by step. Yes. And then you'd be done. Perfect example. Yeah. 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 So we need that way, yeah. but how to live. Probably not. Although, Brian Eno, who's a wonderful music record producer, said that the job of being a producer is having strong opinions. So a band like U2 or Coldplay will hire him to come into the studio and have strong opinions. And I'll say, no, I think we need to uh, completely delete the drums from the middle section. And they'll say, what? No, the drums are important for the middle section. No, it's crucial. He'll say, okay, great. Glad I could help. Now you know that the drums are crucial. Uh, yeah. The fact that you disagreed with me so strongly, yeah. uh, I've just Shows done my job. Shows conviction. Yeah, so if yeah. you could just come in and say, all right, here's what you need to do, 5 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> and if somebody says, like, I can't do it, I want to die, it's like, great. All right, now yeah, we know that's I knew not I for you. I was never a morning person again. <laughs> but, but it's, you know, at least we started with strong opinions, and now you know that that won't work for you. Yeah. But I guess, I guess that makes... It takes some self-awareness to know that that's not working for you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So self-awareness segues beautifully into self-discipline, which you have a lot of. No? Uh, sorry, I, won't, don't, I mean, didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. Well, I, w I would think, <laughs> I mean, from reading, I mean, I have gone down the Derek Sivers rabbit hole pretty far, and you do seem to say yes to the things that are important to you and say no to everything else so that you can leave that time to create the things that are important to you. Mm -hmm. How do you stay in service to that like highest priority and not, because I imagine you would get invitations to do different things and different opportunities and partner with people for different companies and all sorts of things that are spread everywhere. Mm -hmm. How do you keep it true to what you want to do? 
Mostly it's the same answer when you asked why I'm not on social media. Yeah, you just don't want to. I just don't like it. I just don't want to. Um, I don't want to live that way. Like I said, I don't like yeah. those days where I do a little of this, a little of that. I like to throw myself completely into one thing at a time. So if... But even though, like, I just don't want to, and I mean, maybe this is this is a character flaw of my own as well, but the, like, there's plenty of things that I do that I don't want to do. Why? Why? Obligation. Okay. Wait, social... Future opportunities. P personal obligation, like you... Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, personal. I go, like I said, I've become more introverted mm -hmm. as I've gotten old. Like I said, say yes to a lot of things because I know it's good for business. I know it's good for relationships. When really, I'd just love to sit at home with my kids and my dogs okay. and do nothing and you, write romance novels. You can. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine the other day. He's like, he's like what if you did, yeah. though? I'm like, well, that's easier said than done. Like, there goes our home, our school, like the school, the kids, like so much, our life as we know it would have to change. Yeah. And? But you don't, <laughs> yeah, I know. So you sit there and you yeah. go, like you actually, if you feel like you're like, well, do I want to do this? Mm, maybe not. You just go, no. And not worry about any of the follow on consequences. That's so cool. Um, I think not many people would do that. I think it's a nice thought that most people would want to do, but mm. I don't think many people in practice would actually live like that. I think it, it does require the self, uh, introspection to know what works for you and what doesn't. So I think I've tried lots of ways of being. Yeah. I tried starting a record label to help other musicians. I tried uh, running a booking agency. I tried doing this. I tried doing that. I tried lots of things. And I just noticed in myself, like, eh, I don't like this. this yeah. Is, uh, and you never feel selfish? Oh, often. And, well, and was, you're see, fine. <laughs> being selfish is, is not a bad. Yeah. Okay, wait, let's talk I about this in a second. This, yeah. So, um, uh, wait, there's a chapter in my new book called. Um, uh, Oh, damn. Uh, sorry, never mind. I'll, I'll get back to that in a second. Um, inappropriate, f oh, needy, uh, stubborn, inappropriate flirt. Needy, stubborn, inappropriate flirt. And I think selfish would be in that list too. That adjectives that we act as if they are facts, as if they are traits of someone. You know, that person is blonde and selfish. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this guy uh, has red hair and he's needy. Uh, but if you dig into those words for a second, you, f you find that they have hidden judgments inside them. Yeah. Um, that I, I once had to pick apart the word needy because somebody said needy and I kind of stopped. I was like, wait a second, what does that really mean? We looked at it and what, it, what needy means is they act like it's a trait of the other person. Yeah. Needy just means somebody wanted something from me that I didn't feel like giving. Yeah. So now I'm calling them needy. I'm super needy. Are you saying, you're saying about I'm, this? Right? I'm super needy. Okay. <laughs> well, but see, that's your, you're making like, this I'll own judgment. That. But, um, but, um, uh. You're saying when people call someone else. Yeah. When you say that, that person is them. needy, they act like it's, but what they're really saying is I couldn't give that person yeah. what they wanted. And yeah. so I'm going to call them needy to make it their problem, not mine. Yeah. I'm righteous and perfect. They're needy because yeah. they want something from me. Um, but OK, so selfish to me is like that. Is that it's a it's secretly passing a judgment that you shouldn't be looking out for yourself. Yeah. You, you should be beneath others. How dare you yeah. uh, not be beneath others? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I don't know, selfish to me sounds like a pretty positive adjective. Yeah. So is smug. Smug, <laughs> I know it's meant to be negative, but uh, I think you, smug is... <laughs> when you said the word smug, then I could just imagine like a meme of you like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is the smug movement, yeah. isn't it? But it's, smug means that you're living in alignment with your values. Yeah. Like, I'm walking the talk. Like, yeah, here, I'm happy with my life. I'm happy with my life. Yeah. I, I'm proud of my actions. I'm making choices that that I'm, uh, I feel good about. Mm. And then smug is the result of being happy yeah. with your actions. Yeah. So why should that be a bad thing? I don't know, it's odd that we have these. Uh, so cohabitating, can you do that? Mm -hmm. So when you're cohabitating with someone. Mm -hmm. That means living, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, like you've got a kid. 
Uh huh. Do you live with a partner at the moment or? No? Right now, no. No. So you've got a kid there though. Mm -hmm. So you can't be, you can't be making selfish decisions all the time. Ah. Right. So a friend and I were talking about parenting last night. Yeah, like say you're head deep in the, in the book and you're like right. halfway through the chapter and you're in flow and it's your jam and you're thriving. Right. And then your kid's like, dad, we want to go here and explore this thing. And yeah. you want to do both. Mm -hmm. So right now my value system for parenting is, I've done this since he was born. Like I said, he's 12 now. So for 12 years, I, I always just do the right thing, whether I want to or not. Mm -hmm. So I catch myself for a second. Oh, I know why, because it's a friend of mine is pregnant. And we were talking about like what's to come. <laughs> and because uh, it, it will be her first. And she was saying that, you know, everybody's scaring her. I said, look, it's... Oh, really? Yeah. So, it's the most um, wonderful thing ever. Yeah. So I said, look, it's... There's this moment... That people scare pregnant women. It's... Or there's this whinging... Kind of, do we use that word here? Whinging? Team? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, it's a good word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So people, I think, like to kind of complain to get the little sympathy. Yeah. Oh, you know, oh, just wait till they're two years old. That's going to oh, be hard. Okay. Oh, just wait till they're six. Do you know, yeah. that was, I'm the parent that parents mm. hate because I love it. Mm. And always I raved about it and they were like, you know, just wait till they hit the terrible twos. Yeah. You'll see. And then the twos came and they were like cute little puppies and I loved it. Yeah. And then they were like, you know, just wait until they start school and they'll get all bratty. And they were wonderful. And then they were like, wait until they're teenagers. Teenagers are a nightmare. My teenagers are freaking awesome. Yeah. And it's only now that they're old enough that I feel like I can say we did good. Because you right. always live in fear that maybe like we're right. not done yet, that this could turn. Yeah. You know? And then the heroin kicked in. But now I feel in. like yeah. I'm far enough to go, right. no, no, we did okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. Yeah. And, and that exact same thing you said, yeah. too, that, that when the terrible twos didn't come, they said, well, just wait till he's yeah. six, then you'll see. Okay. See, we shouldn't so, do that to each other. So, yeah, my, my current approach, well, my, my approach to parenting is when he's like, Dad, come crawl on the floor with me yeah. or whatever, I'm like, my, my head is like, oh, I fucking don't want to. Yeah. And I just take a second, I'm like, Okay, because yeah. I just, I know it's the right thing to do. Yes. So, um, you're right, that is not selfish. Some, okay, maybe I, I wasn't... Because the value becomes higher when it comes to your kid. Right. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'm not saying it's, you know, everyone should always be selfish all the time. I'm yeah. just saying it shouldn't necessarily be a bad thing. Yeah. Um, I feel like we have like three open tangents right now. No, I'm good. Um, <laughs> and no, wait, but hold on, you were asking about... I was asking... Uh, what was the context of that last The one? context of it was how do you hold yourself to your priorities oh, okay. when it's so noisy? So I moved to New Zealand so that my kid could um, grow up in nature. But maybe even more importantly, um, I'm sure there were places, you know, um, I'm sure there's a place in Northern California that has a lot of nature that I could have lived. Yes. I deliberately put myself on a Pacific island, <laughs> yeah. far from everybody, to help me say no to everything. Yeah. So I knew that I wanted to create an environment where people wouldn't be inviting me to things anymore. Because, ugh, he's in New Zealand. Yes. <laughs> he's gone. And, and sure enough, um, I, I'm glad I don't uh, have the FOMO thing much because, yeah, really some, some dear, uh, very well-connected, successful friends. Yeah. Uh, stopped calling when I moved to New Zealand because <laughs> uh, I used to be in the game and suddenly yeah. I wasn't in the game. I had, I had dropped out yeah. and moved to a Pacific island and had a newborn mm -hmm. and they're just like, they stopped calling yeah. and stopped inviting me to events, stopped. Yeah, um, yeah and I, I had to be totally okay with that. Yeah. Uh, but I created the environment that I knew would work for me. Yeah. So we can do that with our own homes, with um, where you keep your phone, uh, I mean, can you imagine if like how by the front door, how sometimes there's like a little bucket where you drop your keys? Yeah. Could you imagine if we just like just dropped our phone there? Like, no, a mobile phone is something you need when you're not home. Yeah. And just like, that's it. And in the home, we don't have phones. Yes. You know, like some people leave their shoes at the door. Mm -hmm. If you like, we leave our phones at the door. We should definitely do that more. Um, but it's like you, you could choose to do that if you knew that that's the environment you needed to fit your value system. Yeah. Because some people don't value that. They say, no, no, it's important to me that I'm connected and available to my team all the time. Oh, no. But, you know, I mean, some people, that works for them, yeah. you know? And the way that, they, that's what I didn't get to 
uh, I forgot to finish. The people with the Rolex watch? Yeah. It doesn't work for me, but for some of them, it works for them. Mm. Um, you know, they might have even asked those philosophical questions about, like, what is it for? And, and they're like, well, I mean, to maybe me... Maybe it can improve their perception of self, which then gets them to f perform. Right. Better. Or they could say, this is, I am being my, uh, like, whenever I was a kid, I dreamed yeah. that someday I would look like this. And, yeah. and now I'm, I'm being my highest self, wearing the best watch that's yeah. a piece of art. And, and it reminds me to be my best, whatever, yeah. you know, if that works for you. I must say, yeah. when my last company got towards its end in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. I got a BMW, like mm -hmm. a fancy, sexy car. Mm -hmm. And I did love it. Yeah. And then I wondered what that meant about me, <laughs> that I loved it so much. And I'd walk up to it and go, damn, it's a sexy car. And I loved driving it. Mm. Would never buy one again. Don't need it in my life. But it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. So I kind of get it. Yeah. Kind of get it. Um, what does a meaningful life look like to you? Mm. I don't think in those terms at all. Right. Um, I just do whatever's interesting me most right now. Really? I think the, to say meaningful is to uh, ascribe a plot. And again, for some people, feeling like their life is an epic tale that has great meaning mm -hmm. and is, and started here and is currently here, but it's going there yeah. and it's gonna circle around for some people that story helps guide their actions and means a lot to them. Yeah. Um, and I've considered it, but no, for me, I, I've just found what drives me best is to follow whatever interests me most. And I don't think just of it- Just for in, that next little bit. Yeah, I don't think of it in terms of meaning at all. Yeah, so interesting. Yeah. A lot of these questions I'm not asking for a friend also. They're for me. Oh, <laughs> but that's a big one that I have. The Anthony Robbins mm -hmm. days, I always had like life plan, life purpose, 10 year plan, broken mm -hmm. into five year plans, broken into one year plans, broken into 90 day action steps, weekly KPIs, and then daily tasks, like ninja level planning. So mm -hmm. it was no wonder that I hit like the wall <laughs> right. with that. But since I've let that go, I have like the reason I wanted to ask that question was I have gone, well, in the absence of that, like, do we really just go, all right, what's next? And just do the next thing. Like it feels almost free fully without having that plan in place. Want to hear a big idea? Yeah. I haven't dove into this yet. Long-term plans are who you were. Uh, yeah. Today's plans are who you are. 100%. Isn't that badass? Yeah. I didn't come up with that. I just heard it a version of that today, and I was just thinking about that. Like, that's right. Long-term plans are usually yeah. what you thought before. Yeah. Uh, and then today's reality yes. can be different. So if you follow today's reality. 100%. Sorry. Even in a business. Even like... We're making our long-term plans for a business. Yeah. Like, oh, okay, but our clients are asking for this today or things have happened in such and such in this way yeah. and this is what our business needs today. Really, business should be short-term focused because it keeps it more mm. like practical and real, uh, uh, attuned to the current reality of your clients. Yeah, this is very true. So the other day I was cleaning out a cupboard, as you do, and found, I wrote this book, like 101 Dreams mm -hmm. book that I had that was like a stationary thing that had it all written out and I had the 101 goals. So talking mm -hmm. about like your plans are who you are like then, not mm -hmm. who you want to be in the future. And there was a ton that I have achieved and a ton that I have no interest in achieving anymore. And it was a really nice, I filled it in probably, I hadn't given birth yet. So I was I know, 22 mm -hmm. maybe. Um, and I was looking at that and going like the chapters, everything that I wanted then is so different to what I want now. Like one of them was, you know, I wanted five investment properties and I wanted to be worth $10 million. And I had like all of these set things that were so important mm -hmm. at that time of what I thought we needed to have. Um, and I was really looking at that and going how much the chapters of life that we lead. And that was really written from the point of view of, you know, I was newly married, didn't have any kids. The whole life was stretching mm. before me. I was a new adult. And then looking at the chapter where I was like, had babies. And that was a very different limiting sort of existence there. And now I have man children, which is mm. 
wild to me. And then soon they're going to be gone. Mm-hmm. Like, and it's only now I've started thinking, well, what next? Like life as I know it is not going to exist anymore. Do you, do you live in, in a chapter sort of way? Because, I mean, you're in New Zealand right now too. Yeah. Yeah? Okay, yeah, just, I mean, you nailed it, same, same as you just said. Yeah. yeah? It's definitely, there's this, these eras in your life. Yeah. yeah. What yeah. is, do you know what the chapter will be once your son grows up and moves out? Yeah, despite what I just said about long-term plans, yeah. I make hundreds. Um, yeah. I live in, my, I'm sitting there in my... Isn't that fun though, having so many different oh, yeah. realities and going, we could oh, do this, yeah. we could do that, we could be this, we could be that. And they're like, yeah. I want to be it all. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know if... if uh, You've done this. I I used to dive into one at a time. I'd be like, oh my God, I know what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just make up one. I'll sail yeah. around the world. Yeah. And I'll just I've get into it. And let's just say, I like, imagine like I dive down the rabbit hole and this yeah. kind of boat and this and the plan. You start to this. And, I do. This. And, and I might even like go tell friends, guess what? I've decided that this is what I'm going to do. And, um, <laughs> and then say like it's two months later and you're like, I want to have investment properties. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, something that conflicts with sailing around the world, right? Yeah. And, and then that uh, sailing around the world idea kind of fades and you go into the new, yeah. uh, you know, I'm going to be a dog trainer. <laughs> you know? um, there, see, that would, that would conflict with sailing around the world. Yeah. I'm going to be a dog trainer. Um, and, uh, and then you kind of feel bad, like, oh, I, I'm an idiot. I changed my mind too much. Yeah. So my solution is I made a folder on my computer called Possible Futures. Yes. And now every time I have one of those, I fully realize that I, like I open a new text file and in the Possible Futures folder, I'll make sailing around the world. Yeah. And in that file, I will dump all of my plans, my detailed sketches, yeah, exactly, that. you know, what boat I'm going to buy. <laughs> uh, by the way, this actually helps me that I'm, sailing around the world has never been one of my actual ones. It helps me to detach. Like, yeah. if I were to talk about what I really wanted to do, I wouldn't be able to talk with such detachment. But then, um, in that moment, it feels like, oh my God, I'm going to do this. But yet, just the fact that it's in a possible futures folder mm-hmm. helps me uh, either dive in or detach guilt-free. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, all right, this might happen. Because now there's like 120 things in there. Yeah. And then when I get to a certain point in life when, say, like, I finish a project, I finish a book... Yeah. I wrap something up, then I'm like, so, what next? I'm like, all right, possible futures, and I'll, I'll open the folder, and I'll. What look. is one that's in there that's really exciting? Um. And. I mean, I'll, I, I top my head right now. Uh, would be to move to either Bangalore or Dubai. Wow. Uh-huh. Two very different places. Uh-huh. Uh huh. For two different reasons, I already yeah. have a lot of friends in Bangalore. And I just went to Dubai for my first time last year, and I'm currently fascinated with it. Yeah. It is, it is the bar in Star Wars. It's the bar in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it couldn't be, though, <laughs> more far removed from where you currently live. Is that the purpose? Is well, to it's, go, um, let's just go crazy here and go from one extreme to another? I mean, it's still like right, right, yeah. New Zealand, super yeah. yachts and bougie Oh, gold no, no, no. Everywhere. Okay, no. You're, Not that you're talking about, okay. Just like the state of Nevada has the Las Vegas Strip, yeah. and, but then there's also... Oh, uh, okay. That's the only Dubai I've do, seen. Have you been? Yes. Okay. But I've only seen the bougie. Okay. I, have, yeah. I will not look that direction. Okay. The only Dubai I'm interested in... Yeah. It, okay, my, my good friend there, um, his grandfather built the first building in Dubai ever. Wow. He's an Emirati guy that his, his great-grandfather came up with that original tribe yeah. uh, like 150 years ago from Abu Dhabi because they were having... Uh, you know, clashes between the Bedou tribes and they came up there to this little fishing village. It was like, you know, huts and decided to make it their new place. Yeah. And uh, he's been teaching me about like Emirati cultures and traditions. Yeah. And I was like, that's the side I'm interested in. And I think it's yeah. interesting that, you know, that I'll stick with the bar in Star Wars metaphor mm-hmm. that these strange creatures from around the galaxy <laughs> come to Dubai and you'll have the... Uh, the, the Nigerians with their their green robes, and then the the Russians with their bellies hanging out, and the sunburned Brits, and then the Indians and the Pakistanis, uh, all together in one place. I guess to conduct some trade and then get on their spaceship, you know, yeah. back to uh, somewhere else. 
And I just find it so culturally fascinating to talk with everybody there. So just uh, one of the best days of my life was at the Dubai Mall, sitting at the second level, where there's an escalator going up to the second level, an escalator to the third level. And I sat in a little tea shop there at the second level and just like sat there for hours <laughs> just watching these people in their different garb and their yeah. traditional robes and all that, like just going by, just like, oh my God. And for every uh, you know, Muslim woman that was like completely covered where you can just see her eyes. Yeah. And then the next one comes by with like boobs out to yeah. here with the lips and the like, oh, uh, yeah. the horrifying plastic surgery. And yeah. it's like, this is fascinating. Uh, but so, to live there? Just because of that, like, yeah. I would want to, um, I would let people know that I lived there and I would try to meet all the people passing through. Yeah. So that's what I did in Singapore for two and a half years. Yeah, wow. I very, was very public, like I live in Singapore now, yeah. and I got to meet everybody that was passing through Singapore. Yeah. Even like the, the, the founder of Stripe yeah. was passing through Singapore. Uh, I was the only person he knew in Singapore that time. So like I spent the afternoon with Patrick Collison. And then Kevin Kelly, one of my heroes, was passing yeah. through. I was the only person he knew in Singapore, so I got to spend the day with Kevin Kelly. I spent his 60th birthday with him. So that's the strategy. Right. Just position yourself at yeah. like a layover space. <laughs> yes. You get to meet so many people. Yeah. Um, and then, but just the mix of cultures. Like when you're in Dubai, you could just, literally, you just turn to anybody. You say, yeah. where are you from? And it's like, I'm from Cameroon. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know? it's a different story. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. So anyway, sorry, that's one of my possible futures. I might not do it. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's I still, uh, yeah, it's, it's still six years until my boy is like done with school in New Zealand. So yeah. see how I feel in six it goes years. goes very fast. Yeah. It's not very far away. But I'll keep that in possible <laughs> futures. I don't know. If, wait, did that answer your question? You asked about um. Yes. What was the actual question? Was the, the question was <laughs> meaningful life. <laughs> oh. That's how we got there. Okay. Yeah, which was which was really good. Um, yeah. In in what to do next with chapters? That's what we were looking at. Chapters, chapters right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, I would highly recommend that. It, there are very few things that I I will say everybody you should do this yeah I think keeping a possible futures folder I love uh, that idea is, I think everybody yeah. should do that Just let yourself have, dive I in I have too many that but I want to okay. do yeah. but that's what I mean the, it is the solution to having too many yeah to keep them all in a place and then actually like let's say I'll just pick another, you know, the dog trainer went, say like three years ago you thought it would be a great idea be a, to be a dog trainer and then suddenly in 2024 you're just like yeah, now you get to go back to that file, mm. add on to it some more, add to what you've learned. Yeah. And then maybe you leave it and suddenly in 2027, you're just like, you know, now that we're living off in this rural space, yeah. I'm going to do it. I've been thinking about this for years. This idea won't go away. I really yeah. want to be a dog trainer now. And now you can refer to years of notes on it. Yeah. And the other 112 things that you're not doing, you can feel okay about. Yeah. This is the one for now. So I was talking to my, my coach the other day mm -hmm. and he's wonderful. And he was telling me, though, I struggle with this, uh, not taking it slow, but, but going too fast mm -hmm. all the time. Um, he's like, you've got to look at your time, just even in a weekly view, not even in how many possible futures you want, but even just like in a <laughs> micro level and only do the things that you value the most. And I'm like, I value all of it. I love all of it. There's none of it I want to mm -hmm. say no to. Mm -hmm. And you're super into stuff, too. Like you get really excited about what you're Clearly. doing, which I love. <laughs> I am overly enthusiastic about all the things that I'm doing. So when mm -hmm. I look at my schedule and look at what I want to say yes to, there's usually too much in there for like the actual logistical time and energy available. Mm -hmm. So when you want to do more things and to talk with more people and to get into life, how do you discern when enough is enough? Mm. I'm not sure I am. If I'm understanding the question correctly, Again, the possible futures thing is um, that was my way of managing the idea of wanting to do too much. Yeah. It's like by, by knowing that I've saved all my thoughts about it. So you can it, park it there and then you're park, like, it's good. Good metaphor. Yeah. It's parked there. I can go. I've got the keys to that car. Yeah. I can go pick it up anytime. It helps me get like peace and closure to say yeah, like, all right, I'm going to come back to that. It's not that it's yeah. gone. So it's not like choosing one thing doesn't mean that the rest will never happen. Mm. It's just, I need to do this one now to completion. I'll come back to that one later. Yeah. For, somehow that gives me peace of mind That's to nice. throw myself into one. Yeah. I'm because I'm just that. choosing it for now. Yeah. <laughs> because it's for now. I want to I do things to completion, right? Yeah. Like when I have an idea for a book, 
I'm like, head down, I'm just doing this. And it's like, oh, Tina, there's so many other things I'd, I'd like to be doing right now. But I'm like, I just have to finish. Like, yeah. Am I typing like, I don't actually type like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it'd take a while. But it's cute. I, I, I feel like Linus at the piano. You know, um, but uh, I'll just throw myself into one thing, knowing like, okay, yeah. this is for now, and I want to finish it. And then I'll lift my head up, look at the other things, yeah. and make a, pick another one. Okay, so that's with time. With things, the minimalist thing. Mm -hmm. I have to ask you about the minimalist thing. Do you really only have like two cups and like a few outfits of clothes? You do. Like actually, and you never go, I wish I had more variety. How many times have you moved house? Uh, many. Really? Yeah, we moved 11 times in 17 years. Okay. And now we've been in the one place for three years and we won't move until our kids are done. Okay. Yeah. But despite that, I mean, each time you pack up all your stuff and you don't resent it? Well, I don't. And this is, okay. this, so, you know, I had a really interesting thing. We redid our wills, all our mm -hmm. estate planning and everything, mm -hmm. like a couple months ago. Mm -hmm. And one of my best mates is moving house. And he moved and left everything, sold all his furniture and just moved into the new house with like a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no moving trucks, no nothing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the moment that I had when we were estate planning was I was going through and I was looking around my office, just my office, for example. Mm -hmm. There are beautiful trinkets. Mm -hmm everywhere it is like from my travels i'll usually buy one thing that mm. means something to me and i put it there and i love it and i'm looking around and going so when i do, what will happen to all of this and so I, I asked my kids i'm like is there anything here that you would want and they both said one thing neither of which was the thing that i would have ever thought that they cared about and, then, and I'm like, what would you do with the rest? And they're like, mm, give it away to someone that would like it, I guess. Maybe take it to the nursing home they might. And I was like, all of these treasures that I have collected mean nothing. Mm -hmm. But then I was looking at it going, no, I still love my things. Mm -hmm. Love my things. It's... So I'm intrigued. Proven to have a po powerful effect on uh, your mind to have certain things around. Yeah. That they even in like academic situations they did like very subtle like almost subliminal uh things around the room then asked people a question there and and their answers were predictable based on the subtle things like really? they would hide uh like subtle little dollar signs done in a um ambiguous way and then ask some questions their, their answers were more selfish than if they had showed photos of like nature or whatever then their answers were more like yeah know, and See, the, the stuff that's around us affects how we think. And so that can be a beautiful reason to have these trinkets that mean a lot to you. Yeah. Because it's, it's like helping you. And like, you don't you know, have that. I don't. No. Um, but sometimes I think I should. <laughs> uh, like, oh, okay, I hear it's good for me to have trinkets yeah. around. Or even um, I went to a... Uh, so sentimentality is like not a thing. It's mental, not physical. Yeah. I'm very sentimental with many uh, thoughts and people and all that, but like the physical stuff, eh, I, th I just moved house so many times. I just, yeah. mm, just I do it like Get a friend. a bigger I, truck. Every time, well, no, every time I move, I do it like your friend. I always bring yeah. nothing with me. Um, but um, the, uh... oh, I was, in a, I was in a hotel once that recently ha had a, uh, the big bookshelf with like 200 yeah. books on the Dreamy. wall. And I went, oh God, that's nice. Like right now I just do eBooks. I have no You physical... have no books? I, ha I don't have any books. Um, you have no books no. even. Um, Derek. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, wow. But I, so I actually thought of like maybe going to um, a used bookstore and like, or basically Presenting a list of my favorite 200 books to a used bookstore and just saying, here. Find them. Yeah, if you find these, I'll buy them yeah. from you. But I would only do it as visual props because I've already read yeah. the book. I already have my notes. So I would do them as the visual props, like somebody putting pictures yeah. of nature around them. To, you know. Wow. Yeah. I have that in my office, like books, and they're color-coded in a <laughs> rainbow. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You're not surprised. You nerd. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but I will go back. Like I have the notes from your books, for example, mm. but I will go back and I will read it again, the mm. whole book. Okay. Because I don't just want the cliff notes sometimes I want. And right. what I find yeah. is there's another book that I just read that I hadn't read in ages. And 
um, One Minute Millionaire by Mark Victor Hansen. Mm -hmm. Love that book. But I read it and I, I haven't read it for ages. And when I read it, it like means something different or I pick different things up oh, that yeah. I wouldn't have read and took note of yeah. before. I, I have reread like three or four of my favorite books ever. Yeah. Uh, it was weird rereading Awaken the Giant Within oh. last oh, year. I, would. I might do that too. Oh, it's so dated. It's so weird. Yeah. I read it in 1989 or 90 when it yeah. first came out. It's referencing O.J. Simpson as a role model, Michael Jackson, um, all these like oh, yeah, 80s business that. role yeah. models. I mean, of course. You know, um, yeah. uh, well, like the old president of Chrysler or something like that. I'm yeah. like, wow, these references. Like, yeah. nobody under 50 would know who these people are anymore. Yeah. Uh, so it's, but that it has, su there's such a good message in the book. I feel like uh, his team should rewrite it for yeah, him. Yeah, I Strip think out so. all the old references. Yes. Um, okay, I'll try and stay stay on track here. I'm like, <laughs> I've, I've got, oh, so useful, not true. Mm -hmm. It's coming out soon, which mm -hmm. is yay. Um, I'm still writing it. Do you so, know when it will be released? Oh, there's no dates. We can't say, like, it. keep it. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> and so you self-publish too, right? Yeah. 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 Because you like the control over distribution or why do you go self-publish? That wasn't one of my questions, but I'm curious. Sure. Um, is it, are you self is this? I did my first book self-published because I couldn't get a publisher because okay. I was a no one. But then I did my second one published. And there's fours and against for both of them that mm -hmm. I found. Like I, you know, I was mentioning that my first book is the one that you can see the screen of, not the other one, because that's mm -hmm. the that's the cover I designed. Mm -hmm. My second book, Million Dollar Micro Business, the publisher designed, and it's cream, <laughs> and I don't like cream. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, it feels it like weird to like something brown that... riding, and I'm like, <laughs> really? And there's it's it's about like online business, mm -hmm. and the icon on the front is a mouse with a cord. Anyway, so yeah. that's why I didn't love the publisher. But yeah. next time I will get a deal to say that I have creative right. control. Right. Yeah. Um, I just found that, I mean, the reason, you know, my little nerdy reasons don't matter. I like, you know, I built cdpb.com. I was like, I can yeah. build a little store. Distribution wise, do you put it in all major bookstores or you mainly sell online? I actually, for the first year or so, it's only on my Sivers.com website. I don't even put it in Amazon. Really? I'm like, yep. I'm like, no, screw Amazon. Yeah. I don't need to give Jeff any That's more money. because you're famous. You can. Right. Yeah. But I mean, we all can. Yeah. I mean, okay. It's easy to dismiss it and say like, okay, but that's because you're famous. But no, even me deciding to do that, I'm sure I'm cutting my sales in half mm. by doing it. But it makes me happier. I've just yeah. noticed I am, I am happier selling half as many books, but entirely through my store. Yeah. I mean, hell, even if it's a tenth, maybe I could sell ten times more books if I put it on Amazon from day one and did the whole thing people do, like, hey, let's get the lead up to the first week of sales yeah. so I can be on the charts so yeah. people can discover I it. I'm that. like, I'm letting go of all of that. Yeah. I will not be number one ever, and it's okay because it makes me happier to do it this yeah. way. Um, what is your number one goal when you put the book out? Uh, to be done with it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a number one. Yeah. Okay, what, I'll ask <laughs> anyway, a better question. What's number two? What is the number one goal when you write a book? Oh, oh, it's different every time. Yeah. Um, the, uh, all right, well, okay. So check this out. Uh, Your Music and People I actually wrote first. Yeah. And that was written from 1999 to 2005. It was my ongoing like advice to musicians. Like yeah. when musicians would say something like, um, hey, how should I price my music? And like, actually, and I'd write something to address that. And then musicians would say, um, uh, I don't know, let's just say whatever questions would come up, I'd write an article addressing that it try, in a way that wasn't timely, but more like philosophical. Yep. And then later I put all of those together. I think there were like 88 of them or something like that into a, a book called Your Music and People. Yeah. Um, and so that had a goal of just, that was just collecting something I've already done. Then Seth Godin called and said, um, I'm starting a new publishing company and I want you to be my first author. And what can you say to that? But okay. Yes. So, um, so anything you want was written in 11 days because Seth asked me to. You wrote that in 11 days? Because those are stories I had already been telling to friends and at conferences I'd been on stage. Um, some of them were already written on my blog, about half of them were already were. The other half I'd just been telling anecdotally at dinners and whatnot. 
And so when Seth said, oh. put it into a book, I'm like, oh, all right, it's just telling my story. That's easy. So there was no um, self-discovery or learning in the writing of that book. Yeah. It was just telling my story of what's happened in the past and the lessons I learned from it. Hell Yeah or No was... Um, crazy book. Thank you. Uh, oh, no, this one, How to Live, the Crazy Oh, no, yeah, no, sorry. We're yeah. Still, yeah, so we're talking Hell Yeah or No um, was, again, just collecting up. People have been asking my advice about, like, general kind of how do I make decisions in life. Yeah. So, again, I, I just collected together articles I'd already written, and I just wanted to put it into one. Like, there we go, it's done. It's the same right. thing, Okay, yeah. so then, How to Live... Um, was, it's more of an art piece. Um, it's an, have, did you read Some by David Eagleman? No. No, okay. So it helps to know, on the first page of the book, it says this, this is an homage to Some by David Eagleman. Yeah. So David Eagleman is a neuroscientist that wrote a beautiful little fiction book with a weird format. Um, See, so yeah, it's called uh, Some, spelled S-U-M. Yeah. And... The subtitle is 40 Tales from the Afterlives. And it's 40 little two to three page long short stories that say what happens when you die. And each one disagrees with the rest. So it's like, when you die, um, you awaken to find out that in the last life you chose to be a human, but you could have chosen any animal. And now it's your turn to choose again, to choose to be any animal you want. So you decide to be a horse. And then it's a fascinating little story. But then the next chapter, it'll say, like, when you die, you find out that you are an artificial intelligence program. That what you knew of as your life was actually the running of a, of a program that is you. And now the program has ceased running, and the, the um, little caveman-type creatures that created you want to know the meaning of life. But you, everything you try to explain to them, they're too dumb to understand. Um, and then the next chapter will be like, when you die, you're in a giant mansion that is uninhabited and you walk around for days and days like there's nobody there until you finally find somebody else and you say excuse me what's going on and they said oh well turns out that uh god is a creator not a manager he created life billions of years ago and forgot we exist and everybody's waiting for him to come back but he's not a manager he's not here he doesn't you and know so that inspired you to write okay so yes so this format of, of like oh my god i love this it's like every chapter disagrees yeah. with every other chapter. What a fun way to spin your head around. And what a beautiful format. It's like <laughs> spin your head around. Because it it's was. it's also like um there's there's a piece of artwork in Wellington, New Zealand where I live, uh uh right downtown across from the New World supermarket, uh where there are like a hundred sharks drawn by a hundred different artists. Oh beautiful. Uh on a giant mural. And so every shark is like completely different, like a different artistic rendering of a shark. Yeah. But they gave them a certain, like it has to be maybe no, uh, one meter by a half meter and it has to be facing left, yeah. go. And, and I just love that format of like having 40 different artists give the same challenge. Yeah. So to me, the book sum was like 40 different answers to one question, what yeah. happens when you die? I loved that book so much, I read it twice, and one day I was like driving down the highway in South Island, New Zealand, and I went, oh my God, I want to write a book called How to Live in that format. Oh my God, this is brilliant. I was like, and then every chapter is going to disagree with every chapter. It's going to, every chapter is going to say that it has the answer on how to live, yeah. and it's going to disagree with all the other chapters. It's like, <gasps> and I just, I started, you know, just Isn't typing furiously. Isn't that the furiously. best feeling ever? Love it. When you get that feeling, you're yeah. like, this is what I'm going to do. But Love then it feeling. ended up being this, like, I want to put everything I've ever learned in my life into this mm. book. And so, Tina, I, like, reviewed every, all of my notes from every book I've ever read, mm. all of my diaries, everything I ever wanted my kid to know in case I die before wow. he's older. Yeah. I poured everything into the book and the rough draft was 1,300 pages. Wow. And then I spent two years editing it yeah. down to 112 pages because I like short books. Yeah. So incredible that you wrote the others so fast, but then that one, did you care more about that one? Or mm -hmm. was that, yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's more like poetry. It was such know. mind fuckery to read it. Thank you. It was... Because I was telling you this before we hit record, but the others I read, like like reading them, not guru-esque, but like that, yes, you tell me, Derek, I'm, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I was highlighting and I was like, yes, I agree, this is amazing. And then I had that 
when I got that book out and I was like, yes, I read it. And I'd read some and I'd go, this is fantastic. And then I'd read some and I'd go, oh, I think we've taken a bit of a left turn here. <laughs> this sounds a little bit different. I'm not quite sure on this one. And then you read, and then it'd completely disagree with that. And I'm like, oh, I see what you're doing here. Like this is, but it was really good to sit. I have never read a short book so slow as that book. Cool. When I read each chapter and then sat there going, just staring off into space like, good. Good. Huh, what do I actually think and do I agree or do I disagree and what and it was beautiful for that. Thank you. Yeah. What did you take from the the last two pages with the two images? Oh, I can't remember the last oh, really? two oh. pages. So to me it was the look. the punchline. So that's what it, what I was also like, stuck with for mean? like 2 years. How do now I I feel awful that I'm no. like, what? I don't know the last two pages. <laughs> How do I finish a book of this format? Oh, yeah. The orchestra. So yeah. <laughs> um so to me, the orchestra. So that is like I'm going to put a picture of that in um, in the notes below, so that so that you can see it. But I was like, that went right over my head. Oh, good. I was like, I don't think I'm, I don't, I, I'm not smart enough to to <laughs> no, get that. No, it's okay. So yeah. So to me, like the most beautiful. You'll have to explain it. If you yeah, I'm about it. to. Yeah. <laughs> so to me, the most beautiful movies are the ones that when it's done, you kind of go, huh. And it's, I did do that. And it sits with you because you're like, wait, so does that, did he die or not die? Yeah. Wait, does that, what does that mean? And I like when you kind of walk out of a movie with a question. And ideally a book could do that to you too. But the thing is, unfortunately, no nonfiction books do that these days. Yeah. They're all just like, well, here's the answer. Cut and dry. Here's a seven step program. And yeah. that's what you should be doing. I know everything. Now you know. Go get them there. You know, it's like you do it well. There, yeah. there's, there's, there's no <laughs> nailed um, it. There's no artistry yeah. to it. It's just like fucking business. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want to write fiction, but like, you want it, it to be a bit whimsical. Yeah, or like like song lyrics that yeah. like when you read like um, the, the Leonard Cohen song lyrics that make you go like, huh? Like I wonder, what's he mean? Like that's an interesting metaphor. Why that? Yeah. Uh, the tortured king. What is that referring to? Yeah. And, and I, I miss that artistry. So it was actually a songwriter friend of mine that that helped, gave me a little encouragement to do this when I said, "What if I just left it open?" Yeah. And she's like, yeah, "You know." And so, okay. So the the whole point of the duck and bunny. Yeah, it's both, right? Um, yeah, it's. The question that the optical illusion asks you yeah. is, is this a duck or a bunny? And you're supposed to kind of like either pick or you're like, oh, well, at first I saw the bunny, but now yeah. I see the duck. Yeah. And but then to me, I, I looked at this for a while like, oh, wait a minute. It's not or you don't switch from duck to bunny. It is a picture of a duck and a bunny both at the same time. I was like, yeah. that's like how to live. It's it's yes. um, we don't say. Okay, I did. I did get it then. Okay, it's like we don't <laughs> like, say. I think it meant more than what I. But yeah, we don't say is selfishness good or is it bad. It's yeah. like, well, yes. Yeah, it can be. <laughs> Depends both. in some situations yeah. and this and that. Um, should I be following my dreams or should I put my dreams on hold mm -hmm. to serve others? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> both. Yeah. In, in different times of your life, different situations. So, yeah. the orchestra seating chart. Mm. Um, is the metaphor for the different times because music is um, time and combining. So if you were to ask an orchestra uh, conductor or say composer, what is the best instrument in the orchestra? Mm. It's a moot question. What do you mean the best yeah. instrument? It's sometimes I need the violas, sometimes yeah. I want the timpani, sometimes I need all the brass, yeah. sometimes I'm going to combine the piano and the cellos. Yeah. So that's like with the, so there are 27 instruments here. I'm so 27. glad that I've got you to explain that because I didn't get <laughs> any of, of that from that, so that's so, so good. So it's like the, um, uh, there are times in your life when you need your trumpets to be playing. Yeah. You know, there are times in your life where you need to go get famous and, and try mm -hmm. to get successful. There are times in your life when you need to mute everything and go to the slow, steady pulse of a yeah. predictable, comfortable life. Yeah. There are times when you want the entire orchestra to play at once. Yeah. And sometimes it can even just be in the course of a day. You can wake up and have a very selfish hour. Mm. 
to yourself before the rest of the I family wakes up. I had a very selfish up. day yesterday. I loved every really? second of it. Oh, that's right. You indulged so here in good. Noosa. It was so good. <laughs> I had a day of nothing in Noosa and it was just good. like, <laughs> I'm like, I should do that more often. Um, okay. All right. I'm gonna go over to money. Okay. Oh, wait. There's yes. one last. You just want to I, 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 No, I, I, sorry. I accidentally nerded out on my books themselves. But you asked, what, was, what are my goals that I'm trying to write? Yeah. I just wanted, I was really trying to say in the big picture that every book has had a different goal. Yes. And so my next book, Useful Not True, is a, I didn't start out knowing what I wanted to say already. I said, I want to learn more about this subject. So I've spent the last two years learning more about the subject. So mm. the purpose of writing this book has been for my own self How long knowledge. have you been writing this book for? Two years, two and a half. Oh yeah, a long yeah. time. Yeah. And so staying on useful, not true for a second, because I do think it is intriguing and I think it will be another similar to that in that it'll mess with our minds Hopefully. a little bit. Um, what is the belief that you have had that you challenged or changed through the process of writing it? Was there one? Oh, always. Um, I mean, ideally, my, my dream life would be to have a belief changed and challenged daily or weekly. Yeah. Um, okay, let's just pick, because we mentioned it earlier, uh, Dubai. Yeah. If you would have asked me a year ago today, Dubai would have been on my top 10 shit list of places I hope to never go in my life. Really? Fuck that place. Yeah. Shallow. What would you call it? Yeah, the glitz? Bougie. The gl bougie. Yeah. The bougie glitz. Uh, yeah hashtag Instagram influencer bullshit, yeah. millionaire pandering, fuck that. Yeah. Um, and then I read, and then I had a, a, a airplane layover and instead of just, you know, two hours, I, I decided to make it two days. Then I read wow. two books about United Arab Emirates um, and then one book that was fascinating about the history of Dubai itself yeah. called City of Gold. It was really well written and like, mm. it's like a page turner it had me up all night. I was like, oh my God, this place is fascinating. Then I went there, then I met this Emirati guy that was teaching me more about the Arab culture. Uh, got me to go to the Al Shandaga Cultural Museum where I went to the perfume house and that like changed my life. And uh, Did you buy a perfume? Perfume has different meaning there. Homes are perfume. Every home has a unique scent uh, and it's a big part of the character. And then when you have guests over, whether it's for hours or days, when you're ready for them to leave, you put on a different scent. Uh, which subtly kind of says, like, it's time to go. Yeah. It's kind of the equivalent of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? um, and... Um, Andy. So, uh, and since I read, like, three more books about Arab culture, and uh, I took something that I was prejudiced against a year ago and am now straight-up prejudiced in favor of. Yeah. And that's one of my favorite things. We take something that you used to know nothing about or used to even be against, mm -hmm. and you suddenly are, are yeah inter like that's the world would be a much better place if more people did that i think yeah. yeah 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 once again something we can wholeheartedly prescribe to everybody should do that yes you should all not dubai in particular but like <laughs> we should all steer towards the things that we feel an aversion towards yes if you hate opera you should get to know opera better mm. if you hate sports you should get to know sports better yeah like, go drive into your blind spots yeah I mean, I have a pro pretty much in Spotify, had my same Spotify wrapped every year for the last three years. Uh, same songs, same things, very boring. Mm -hmm. Same with like your like movies should end open-ended. Mm -hmm. I watch Hallmark romantic comedies. Mm -hmm. Don't know what that says about me, but well, it, love them. Time to switch it up. Right. Make yourself. So Did you see Poor Things yet? No. Oh. oh, that's Emma Stone's movie. Uh, it's, yeah. it's one of my favorite movies in years. Okay, I'll have to watch it. It takes so. repeated watchings too, like oh, th really? especially if you can rent it. One, yeah, it's the first time you see it, it's like, whoa, what the? And then yeah. you watch it again, it starts to make more sense. Yeah, and, okay. See, I love these things. See, I mean, my younger son is into jazz ah. and the distinguishment between like New York jazz and New Orleans jazz. And Ooh. so he's been making these playlists and now I'm listening to all of his music and love it yeah. and would have thought, never. Yeah. Anyway, so little things that can work as well. Question, with Useful Not True, and I was listening, my favorite interview I think I listened to of yours was the one you did with Mark Manson. It was great. Um, 
but with and reading a lot of the chapters that you've published on your blog as well, do you ever get tired of thinking about thinking? Mm. No. No? No. You never like wish you could just shut it off and go enough of the examining. You just want to just chill ignorantly. No, it's just my favorite thing. Yeah. I just love thinking of different perspectives. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the greatest joys in life. And it never switches off in your in your brain. No, not really. No. Yeah. And that doesn't get exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, because it's just my favorite thing. Yeah. You know, it's like. Yeah, it's it's the thing I love most in life is thinking. It's interesting. Yeah. I've been doing a lot of work on it in the last few years. But one thing that I said to my coach is, is some days I just want to stop thinking about thinking. Mm. I'm now thinking so much about thinking and what I'm thinking and questioning what I'm thinking that I'm like, oh my gosh, enough. I mean, okay, look, every week, I reliably spend 30 hours a week one-on-one -on -one with me and my kid. Mm. And when I'm with him, my own ambitions are on pause, yeah. parked. And uh, we just, he leads the way and I just yeah. follow. And if he wants to go surfing, then we're going surfing. If he wants to play in the forest, we play in the forest. Um, if he wants to, he last week decided he wanted to learn to sew. Uh, we started sewing last week. Uh, and um, so in a way that kind of turns off my mm. brain because I'm just there fully engaged in yeah. whatever he's doing. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay. When you think of successful, who's the first person that comes to your mind? Me? Oh, smug. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, I mean, uh, sorry, that's just ridiculously honest. Um, I'm not saying I'm the epitome of success, but aren't we all thinking of ourselves first mm. with almost anything in life, you know? No. Okay, but hold on. No, it, I don't think we are. <laughs> okay, but, but if, if you say something like, who's the first person that comes to mind when you think of uh, watches, then wouldn't you just kind of think, kind of consciously you're not, your brain is thinking, well, my watch, because you're thinking like, because yeah. everything's kind of filtered through my desires. Yeah. So my honest answer with that is like, well, I think of myself first because I think, wait, successful compared to what or who? What is my definition of success? Oops, I'm, I'm yeah. thinking about me now. So my brain didn't just jump immediately to um, Richard Branson or something. Yeah. Um, my brain thought of myself first and then it's like, well, wait, wait, what, what is my definition of success? And then there's the answer to your question. I thought of myself first. Yeah. What is your definition of success? Uh, just achieving what you set out to achieve. That's it. That's it. Yeah. If, if you set out to, to write a, a great poem or bake a great cookie yeah. and you did it, then that's the success. I love that's that. it. Is there, so probably not because you've got a different de definition of success, but was there like a point that you felt like you made it, like you are living? and you did achieve what you set out to achieve? Ooh. Probably when CD Baby got momentum, meaning when it was clear that people really like this thing, mm. because it was the first time in my life that I felt I was rolling downhill instead of uphill. And I mean that like, as far as ease, yeah, like all my years trying to be a musician, I mean, I was a musician, trying to be a successful musician. Yeah. Um, it just felt like every door I tried to open was locked. Yeah. Every... In Australia, we say pushing shit uphill. There you go. Yeah. I was just about to say, yeah. yeah, it just felt like everything was uphill. Yeah. Yeah, I was pushing shit uphill for years. And then at the age of what, 28? Um, 29, I, yeah, I started CD Baby when I was 28 or so, and, um, and then just like people just started signing up for it, and then more and more, and then people telling their friends, and suddenly everybody was like banging down my door to yeah. do this thing that I did in it three days as a hobby, yeah. and sorry, I guess it took two weeks to set it up, um, but uh, that was the first time I felt like maybe once that kept going past two weeks and then it was like <laughs> three months into it and people keep coming my way. I was like, wow, 
It's the first time. Wow, I really made something people love. Yeah. And from yeah. that point on, you're like, I'm my own version of success. Oh, I'm my own version of success. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess a lot of my actions have been filtered through that. Yeah. I mean, I'm being stupidly honest here. I know, like, I'm saying things that we're not supposed to say. You know. Um, well, you know, like. Why aren't we supposed to say Well, you know, the, that? like, the, um, even when I heard myself say that thing earlier about, like, well, social media was invented after I was successful. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> fuck, that's honest. <laughs> but yeah. I guess that's true. I mean, it's a reality. I'd be doing some weird lie if I yeah. said otherwise. I love um, that. So, yeah. So I guess since then, it's like, well, I've got my own version of success that. Uh, yeah that I know people are happy with, um, when, you know, 10 years of running the company, I knew my clients were really happy. Yeah. The fact that I didn't drive a fancy car or have mm -hmm. a fancy watch um, was a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe I even added to my brand or whatever, even though I didn't think of it that way, but maybe people saw that. It's just it like- have added to my brand. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it, it's, I also, I used to, if you, it's, I haven't done it in years, but, um, for most of my years at CD Baby, I had a really funky haircut. I had really long dreads in back. I have not seen that for, picture. For 14 years. Yeah, there aren't many pictures of it online, but there are a couple. I had it's because you don't have pictures on your website. No. Why? I don't know. I just, I'm not much, I don't have pictures of my phone either. What? Yeah, I don't take pictures. I'm just not into it. Really? Yeah, I don't know. Just... I think I have maybe <laughs> half a million pictures on my phone. <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> no, I love, so do you know, my kids were asking me about this the other day, cause they're like, mom, always with the photos. I picture my old age mm -hmm. sitting in a really comfy chair, just reliving my life, okay. watching my photos. I don't have a great memory mm. and I love photos, love them. I will watch like every plane flight I go on, I sit there and I flick back through there, okay. like through life mm. and I love it. See, I do that with my diary. I've kept yeah. a diary every day. For... Are you ever afraid of someone finding it and no, reading it? No, it's it's like super encrypted on my encrypted hard drive, oh, and you know, of course yeah. it is. Yeah, um, okay. So, um, it's oh, you not don't on like cloud. write it; you type it. Yeah, it's yeah, typed. Lock it away. Locked inside a open BSD. The what about when you die? Will it be system? made available, or it's it's going forever? Uh, maybe just my son. Yeah, I would let him have it. You don't write naughty stuff in there. Even if I did, he'll be old enough by then, right. hopefully. <laughs> um, um, but uh, I relive my past through my diaries. Yeah. It's really interesting to see my inner mo dialogue, monologue, dialogue, whoa, wow. Inner monologue would yeah. just be, what, what inner it's dialogue true. is talking to yeah. yourself. I know, mine's, mine's on my monologue. Um, my inner monologue, uh, you know, dating back decades now, it's fascinating to, to not just look, but to like see what I was thinking inside back yeah. then. Yeah. So I do go through, go through this. Yeah. Things. And so with money. Oh, right. You kind of mentioned this a little bit before. Um, one of my most disliked sayings is money doesn't buy happiness because I think that if you've been broke, there's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on that? And is there a level? Do you think that it's easier for you now? I mean, but you already said that you're very disconnected from money and the financial gains before the success of CD Baby. But yeah, is it but... easier now to not worry about money now that you've got your trust set up? Or do you want to explain yeah. what you did with all the money sure. when you sold CD Baby as well? Um, no, I think that we all have a, um, a set point where we're happiest, something yeah. that feels like, you know, these clothes fit me. Yeah. And I mean that metaphorically, like yeah. this, this amount of money feels like who I want to be. Yeah. And for some people, uh, let's say Richard Branson, I mentioned him earlier. Yeah. Um, I read, I think he's got two or three autobiographies, like yeah. one or two that's like him personally and one or two that's like the history of Virgin. So I read all three. And uh, it's interesting that over and over again, he, he seems to find great fun and sport into getting his back against the wall in some sort of desperation, yeah. like borrowing money from the bank uh, and then getting it till the final hour to having to quickly find a way to pay back the bank. And that's what made some of the most amazing things in his career happen was the desperation of needing to pay back the bank. Mm -hmm. And he seems to just be having fun with it. So to him, I think money just represents a kind of... School card. No, I think it's actually like... I think it's just, um, 
he likes the action mm. of the doing things. And then if it's making money, then it's, it's doing the thing he set out to do. Um, but it seems to all be fun for him, right? But then there are other people I know that, um, that, that they're just not, you know, even if they've got a million dollars or whatever, it's just not enough, man. I just, you know, I'm, I'm just really trying to get here. And they're like unhappy with themselves until they get to this point. Yeah. But then uh, I don't know many people this way, but I, I've read stories of the people who say like win the virtual lottery and they instantly blow it on yeah. this and this and that and they come down to here and the argument is like well that person's set point was probably more like this is how they see themselves yeah. and so if the world gives you this much you knock yourself down to how you see yourself yeah um so in my own case um yeah i, I might be a little bit like one of those knock myself down types mm. but instead of blowing it on stupid things i just once i had enough um, and then way more than enough, I just reorganized my stuff so that, like, I haven't made money. Last time I made money, 2008, and we're 2024 now. Um, so Speaking in books? Um, no, like, uh, so, like, all these books, none of, I haven't made a dollar off any. It's, it all goes straight into a charitable foundation I set up. Yeah. And so I, I set up, like, my Sivers Inc. publishing company, is owned by the foundation. So it's like right. not a single dollar ever comes to me. But that was my way of saying like, okay, I'm happiest with this set point. Yeah. Um, so yes, so money did. It's fascinating. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I think too much. <laughs> I, yeah. I've thought a, lo a lot about this stuff. So it, it's, when it happened that, um, Say like the, the, I remember the first time. So when CD Baby was happening for 10 years, I was just, I wasn't looking at the bank account. I was yeah. just head down, focused on my clients and trying to run things. And I'd look at the bank account and it's like, whoa, I've got $100,000 now. Wow. Because yeah, before that, I was like a broke musician yeah. for 10 years. Just like working hard to get another $500 yeah. to pay my cost of living. I still remember when I had $10,000 in my bank account and Big went, deal. oh my God. Yeah. I thought that was yeah. a dream. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Um, and so... I was just head down and working when the bank account said $100,000, and then it said 200000 and then 300000 I was like, wow. And I remember right around somewhere like around 200000 or 300000 I thought, I think I'm set for life now because that amount, like I know that I've lived on $20,000 for it. So now with... $20,000 a year. Yeah. I've lived on 20000 a year. That wouldn't cover my kid's grocery bill. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, I lived very cheaply for years. Like I had three roommates yeah. and I just ate peanut butter sandwiches and I just never took a taxi. I just yeah. kind of, um, live simply. And, um, but the point is that, um, around that point I thought, wow, okay, so I could invest this money if I put it into ETFs or whatever, yeah. it would do about 8% per year. And now that it's $250,000, that would be about $20,000 a year just in interest. I'm all, I think I'm all set now. And so everything after that point, after 250000 felt like just cherry on top, whatever. And so then the bank account became like $1 million, then $2 million, and $3 million, then $4 million. And I was like, Jesus, oh, man. And it was, I had about $4 million in the bank when I sold the company for $22 million. So that gives a little more context for what's in the story. Yeah. When uh, I was like, wow, okay, so I've, I've got $4 million. I've already paid off all my debts. I've even helped my parents pay off their debts. Um, you know, not mortgage, everything just paid off. And um, and I still have four million in the bank. So when the company buying my company said it, we had the price of 22 million, it's like, wow, what the hell am I gonna do with $22 million? And I really spent hours and hours and hours in my diary asking myself, yeah. what should I do? What could I do? What's another way I could be thinking of this? Uh, I thought, you know, I could buy many homes. And I was like, but I'm only... I could buy a many homes. You know, I could, I could get a fancy car. Like, oh, you couldn't pay me to own a Ferrari. Um, and um, so then I just really thought, like, yeah, the only rational thing to do is to give it to people that need it. If I'm sitting here trying hard mm. to figure out how I can spend it, you know, take a hint. Like, there are people that really need it. Yeah. And if I'm trying to spend it, that's just rationally yeah. stupid. I can't rationally live that way. But you live on more than $20,000 a year now? I guess. 
Um, but so that's why. So with good luck, yeah. I sorry. It was lucky that my lawyer at the time that was putting together the whole deal to sell the company had a background in tax law. So he said basically, all right, congratulations. You know, it's you're you're going to have twenty two million dollars soon. Yeah. I went, eh. And uh, he said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I'm just going to give it away. He said, are you serious? I said, yeah, I've thought a lot about this. I'm just going to give it all away. And he said, how serious are you? I said, completely serious. He said, like, irreversibly? I went, yeah. And he said, because in U.S. tax law, there's a way that we could set this up so that you're, instead of $22 million coming to you, you pay $7 million in taxes and give $15 million to charity, we can put the whole company into a charitable trust now, the entire $22 million will go to charity and never touch your hands. I said, that's what I want. I don't. I, I want it to never touch my hands. Um, so, and so you don't live off that at all. Um, okay, but then the so the whole twenty two million dollars went into a charitable trust yeah. that then pays me out a bit for, for your while I'm alive. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Which even then was more than I only wanted one percent, but the U.S. minimum yeah. was five percent. So then I just reinvest. You know, yeah. Whatever. Do you so. travel economy or business class? Economy. Yeah. Yep. I'm like of course you do. Yeah. <laughs> and I drive the cheapest electric car on the yeah. market yeah so money's <laughs> definitely not a thing well it's okay no but i still look i don't want to sound like um i'm not trying to like look at me look how minimalist i am it's really more like it makes you happy well it did um you said okay the money can't buy happiness it absolutely <laughs> um did for me up to that point. Yeah. So one time a dear friend of mine was, this is years and years ago, we were in Portland. This is like back when I had like $2 million in the bank account. And uh, she was somebody that was like 22 and ambitious and like wanted to get successful. And we, I remember that. We were good friends. <laughs> and, and yeah, you know it well. She was a lot like you, I think. And um, she, she kind of looked at me and she's like, but we weren't talking money at all. Yeah. We were just talking about life. And she asked me a question. I said something that she thought was like, wow, that's a really good answer. And she goes, how are you like so happy all the time? Mm. And I went, well, first you get a million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> she just thought that was the funniest damn thing. She laughed so hard because, you know, money often has these loaded connotations. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, it's honestly helped a lot. Like yeah. having a million dollars in the bank gives me this crazy sense of security of like, you know, it's going to be all right. No matter yeah. what happens, like I could have a major medical problem. Yeah. I could. That's what it was to me is the psychological advantage of mm -hmm. not being desperate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's that's still what it represents. It's still yeah. money represents status to some people. I have n no associations with status to me. It's all about um, protecting the downside. Yeah. It's, it's all about like, I just keep it there in a little yeah. account doing nothing. I live as cheaply as I can yeah. so that if something terrible happens, I can feel okay. Yeah. But it's also like my son at the moment, my oldest son, he has his sights set on being a professional golfer, okay. which the odds are very small. There's mm -hmm. not many people that make it, but he's very determined and planned and going for it, which I love him going for that dream. But it's an expensive sport you've got to like mm. pay to play right with that to get into the right places at the right time and we have had massive discussions on both my kids had jobs mm. as soon as they hit 14 so they could go and get their casual jobs but he can't play tournaments on the weekend with that so he's had to mm. stop his job which means we financially support him and i'm going like the whole lessons around money and what it takes and how much you need to be able to do the different things what do you think on that? Oh, I mean, if that's, that's like one of those, Things I'd, I'd call, put that in with the downside. It's like, yeah, okay. well, you know, if I have a major medical problem yeah. or if I have a kid who, who wants <laughs> whose to dreams do, is yeah. something expensive, well, then yeah. that's. Cause we've been there going, you know, we could make him do, like get him to do night jobs and different things, like really get his grit on, right. you know? But then is it not our job to try and open as many doors for him as possible? It's a really difficult, there's no right answer. Yeah, right. Um, it, and it's, it's it has to do with a lot with his nature and disposition and yeah. your situation. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, totally. Anyway, found that really interesting. Um, okay, so with people that are driven by money, do you see a point in their lives that it no longer becomes 
the thing? Is there like, or has everyone got that different set point? Or have you known people that, so what I'm asking, actually, I'll, I'll rephrase the question. So I have my number. I know other people have their number. I know people that have got to their number and gone, done, great, safe. Right. And they then set about, you know, the whole do what you have to do until you can do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And then they go and they live this beautiful life. And mm -hmm. then I've known other people whose bar just keeps going up and up and up. Mm -hmm. What have you seen most? Mm. Wow, that's a good question. Let's just say that I've got a couple good friends that got rich and then just kept raising the bar. And it really frustrates me because yeah. I can't relate at all. And they say it like, well, you know how it is. I mean, you just, you just want to get to the next tier. I'm like, yeah. no, I can't relate yeah. at all. I mean, that to me is as foreign as some, as if you hear some crazy belief, like, well, you know, women in India, if, mm -hmm. if their husband dies, they'll throw themselves onto the burning fire. I'm like, mm -hmm. In what mm -hmm. world would that ever happen? Like, that's how I feel about people who pursue more money than they need. Yeah. I'm like, I do not understand that. I tr I, like, I'm a thoughtful person. I try to understand this. I can't imagine somebody who has 10 million thinking that they need 100 million. Mm -hmm. I just can't fathom that. Yeah. To me, it's like, if you have $10 million, mm. you fucking stop. <laughs> <laughs> You've won the game. Quit playing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, put down the dice. You know, You've done it. Um, I mean, like, really, I'm, I'm actually thinking of like a board game, you know, it's yeah. like, you know, as if you play Monopoly and it's okay, like, hey, you've won. It's like, no, keep playing. You know, yeah. seriously, go to sleep. You've, you've already won. <laughs> go to sleep. <laughs> um, that, uh, that's how I think about it. Um, that I don't, I don't rationally get it. When, unless, again, unless somebody, it's like pure joy, like the Richard mm. Branson, just wants the to keep making companies. Yeah. Who knows if he's looking at the bottom line, it seems like, but, but I do know, a, a, I have a few friends that, Keep wanting to keep wanting to raise that mm -hmm. target, and um, again, I'm, I mean, I'm I'm trying to understand that. I'm trying to understand that maybe you know we'll put it in the frame of my useful, not true. Like maybe that's a useful belief for them. Mm -hmm. Maybe um, to feel alive is to to have a pursuit. Yeah, and we all want to have a pursuit, and maybe there's nothing more depressing to them than mm -hmm. the thought of feeling done. They never want to arrive. They always want to have the uh, the carrot, you know, and that's where that metaphor comes from, yeah. right? On the stick that you never quite get to. Yeah. Maybe they just like the feeling of continuing to go. Um, what do you think the commonality is between the people that set their bar of enough, reach it, and go to sleep? They've won the game. Well, I'm the only person I know really? of my, my good friends that has done that. Really? But 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 hold on. But then I have lots of friends that just. Money's just not a thing. Like they're pursuing other things. They're mm -hmm. trying to be a great musician as long as they've got. A One few. of my best mates just sold his company for a mm -hmm. lot, mm -hmm. and now he's writing novels. Okay. And he's he would go in your camp. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, I haven't met many like that. So Morgan Housel, who wrote the Psychology of Money, he yeah. and I have been emailing about. He's one of those people that said like. Well, everybody knows the feeling of you always want more. It's ah, just human nature. And yeah. I was just like, Morgan. No, this is not true. <laughs> and I was like, come on. And, and, and yeah. so he actually said, well, then congratulations, Derek. You're the only person I've met that hasn't. Yeah, wow. Well, yeah. I was like, no, come on. I can't yeah. be the only one. Um, but, but, okay, but I do have a lot of friends that are just, they're living their life. They're being, uh, one of my best friends is a therapist. Another one of my best friends is an illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, it's fine. They're earning enough to pay their cost of living and they've got yeah. some savings. It's fine. Like, we... We never talk about money, mm. but then I do have a couple other friends that are really like, they're really driven by money. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to ask my final chapter in our conversation, entrepreneurship. Okay. Do you think entrepreneurship is for everyone? Do you think no. they're born or made? I mean, not for everyone. I love never really that you say that. Oh, good. I, I mean, I've never really understood the born or made. Um, yeah, definitely not for everyone. I mean, everybody has different values, and that's so wonderful that we don't all value the same yeah. thing. And some people really just want to be, like you said, at home with the kids, yeah. and um, or they just want to be comfortable, or they just want the security of a steady paycheck, 
Yeah. They want this number to come in every Friday. Yeah. Exactly as such. They want to know that that's there. They want no risk. Um, yeah, everybody has their different values and it's wonderful. So it's definitely not for everyone. I ask because I know recently, like probably in the last five to 10 years, entrepreneurship's been really glamorized in a way. And there's so many people in our failure rates for businesses mm. starting and ending are so high. And I wonder if that's because people think that they're being told entrepreneurship is for everyone. Everyone's got a business mm. in them. Everyone can do it. And it's just like a field of broken dreams everywhere. It's that messaging is, is a bother for me. And the messaging that, but you kind of have been this, is that, you know, it just happens by accident and you can work for 15 minutes a day and become rich, mm -hmm. of which I don't think is true in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, everybody, everybody's got their different nature that works best for them. Mm. Even the whole, I mean, let's, let's use a famous example of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Yeah. That's like, I know a lot of Steve Wozniak types, and I'm kind of one of them. I think if I would have been in that situation, I would have rather found a Steve Jobs. You go do the onstage salesy shit. I'm really enjoying being in my Unix terminal, nerding out on my PostgreSQL <laughs> database, you know, like... Uh, I don't know what any of that means. Good. <laughs> like, I just, I just, I really love the nerdy side of it. A few different times mm -hmm. I've tried to hire a programmer to hand off my programming. And just even in the act of preparing my project to be handed off to somebody, I'm like, no, I love it too yeah. much. This, it gives me such joy. Actually, that's one of those other things when I said my friends have told me that I'm happiest yeah. when I do one thing all day. My friends have also told me that they've heard me for years being happiest when I'm programming all day. Yes, I you love do that. programming. Yeah. Um, How do you reconcile that with, like, when you put a book out and you, well, maybe this is wrong also. So my question was going to be, mm -hmm. but correct me if I'm wrong, you've got to promote the book. Mm -hmm. And you're doing many interviews and you're doing speaking, putting your face out there. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile that with the programmer, deep thinker that wants oh. to be by yourself? Um, I like the balance. I think if I... Yeah was only programming all the time, I'd get really lonely. Yeah. And I'd want to book a flight to Dubai and go meet a hundred <laughs> strangers, you know? Yeah. Um, but if I had been in Dubai talking to a hundred strangers every day for a hundred days, I mean, there'd be nothing I want more than to be alone yeah. in, in a forest in New Zealand with yeah. my Unix terminal. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that makes sense, that makes sense. It's, it's, but, but everybody has their own that's what, okay, my problem with some of this, like, advice giving, like, all right, what's your morning routine? All right, you heard that, everybody. This is what your morning routine should be. Um, uh, it's just everybody has such different natures. You just got to be listening to yourself, mm. to, to notice when your heart is singing versus shrinking. Yeah. And... Um, and to look at your past behaviors. This is one of the biggest insights I've ever learned, mm. is um, your actions reveal your values. So no matter what you say you value, mm. just look at your past actions, and it'll tell you what you value. If you say, I really want to start a business, I really want to start a business, I really want to start a business, but you've been saying that for years without doing it, it would be, it would be the right thing for your friends to say, no, you don't, you yeah. do not want to start a business, please stop saying that. If you wanted to start a business, you would have done it by now. Mm. Um, and same thing with anything. I, I want to get fit. I really want to get fit. No, I really, really want to get fit. No, you don't. Yeah. That's not really your value system. Yeah. You, you want know? the result, don't want the work. That's the situation right. I've been in for a lot of it. Right. Yeah. Which is okay because some people, like, they can't, uh, they hate a day without going to the gym. Yeah. I'm not one of those people. You're yeah. not one of those people. Great. Yeah. The different values, you know. Yeah. So, I highly recommend to everybody, like, look at your past actions to see your values. Mm -hmm. Notice what you've done in the past that made you the happiest and remember that mm. and use that. Or just notice what you've steered towards in a way that, I mean, obviously not the things where you're like, deeply embarrassed and grateful, you know. Yeah. I used to keep grabbing the whiskey <laughs> bottle. Okay, that doesn't mean that that's what you should keep doing. Yes. Um, Good distinction. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, but, God, it's been so helpful to me to, uh, to know myself better through looking at my actions instead of my theoretical... Yeah. Uh, 
I do think sometimes we're too busy in daily life to notice all those times mm. that our heart sings and sinks. Mm. Right. Like I think that's a, to take pause and notice that is a really valuable skill. Yeah. yeah. That would probably become come very naturally to you. Did it come naturally Me, to personally? you? Yeah. Oh. Um, no, I, I don't think so. I think I, I overthink things. <laughs> it was... Uh, in all the right ways. No, in the, in the wrong ways. I... <laughs> I uh, an old, old, old friend. It's actually my old boss at the circus. Um, <laughs> he uh, he knows me. I've known him since I was, you know, 17, 18. And um, yeah, he always would tease me. When I start doing something new, he goes, oh, now, Derek, don't overthink it. <laughs> he goes, you always overthink things and wreck yeah. them. Just try not to overthink this. Yeah. Um, and it's something I've heard a few different people that know me well say. So no, I think I overthink to a fault. Um, Have you tried but, to change that, or you can't change that? I mean, if I really wanted to, I guess I could, but I am happy with it. And maybe it's just just enough correction. Yeah. You know. Um, but no, so so I don't think I'm a natural at noticing what makes my heart sing. I think I have to uh, almost stop and pay attention to that. Yeah. Um, when you reflect on the business that you built, what was your greatest moment of joy that you had? Is there one that stands out? I think it was that thing I said at the way I, I stopped, uh, what did you say, pushing shit uphill? Yeah. And Was that a moment or was that more kind of, an era? Not like, it was almost a moment. It was like a certain month when suddenly just, yeah. I went from getting two sign-ups a week to getting 10 sign-ups a day or whatever. I, was like, I was like, whoa, this is still <laughs> rolling. I was like, people really like this thing I've yeah. made. Um, yeah, that that felt like, the biggest moment in my entrepreneur yeah. history. Yeah. Wow. Um, with you putting so much of your beautiful overthinking thoughts out into the world, do you ever get worried about negative backlash? Do you ever get any negative backlash or any sort of, like I know for most people that I work with, it's the fear of putting themselves out there mm -hmm. that stops them from spreading their ideas. Do you ever feel that? Yeah. I have an about page on my website. I don't know if you saw it. It's, uh, it's long and I say some stuff in there that, uh, was felt almost too personal. Mm -hmm. It was like an experiment to put that on a page and I put it up there and nobody said anything. And then I started to get a few emails like, wow, you know, this really meant a lot to me that you said this online because I feel the same way and I've felt mm -hmm. so bad that I feel this way. And the fact that you said it on your about page was really like the most heartwarming thing to me. I was like, wow, okay. So I just, I guess I just started getting rewarded. I was gonna say rewards, rewards, rewarded for um, the times when I said a little more than I thought I should have said. Yeah. And so, sorry to be meta here for a second, but like yeah. even in moments like this, you asked me a couple questions today that I just, it's like my brain quickly went like, I could say the thing I'm thinking or dodge the thing I'm thinking. I was like, fuck it, let's see what happens. Yeah. I'm gonna say the thing. Um, maybe somebody will get upset, we'll find out. Um, but so far, every time I've said the thing that seemed too personal or too audacious mm -hmm. or too rude <laughs> or too direct, um, and I had a couple of those today, um, people will later like pull that out as like a funny pull quote. Yeah. Well, you're right. Fuck it. <laughs> if that made for a more interesting, if I could be a better entertainer that way, hey, great. Um, so um, no, I've I've been rewarded for putting myself out there. Yeah. Um, I've yeah I've tried it both ways. I've tried to be aloof, mm. and I've tried to be too personal. Just I've experimented with both. Yeah, and go with it. Being a little too personal seems to. Uh, work for people. I mean, that's what people want, right? Yeah. yeah, totally. That is all my big questions. Now I have a couple of quick questions Great. to finish us off. What are the top two, two to three books that you recommend? Mm, it. Okay, well, my, my real answer is to go to my book list on my website. Yes. 
and I don't mean to just... Do you know, I love how you do that. A couple of the conversations that we've had and you've mm. like pulled in the different articles that you've already written on your website. It's like a systems oh. manual for you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm like, I love this. <laughs> I need to do this myself. This is great. Here's an answer that I've already answered a hundred times before. <laughs> Take it. <laughs> if, so this is no new information. <laughs> my illustrator friend that yeah. I mentioned earlier... Um, often will ask me something and I'll answer with one of my URLs. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why, if you notice, like all my web uh, articles have really short URLs. Yeah. It's because I memorize them. So I know that... So you remember everything that you've written in the past? Mostly. Really? But I, but I memorize the URLs of the one that, that, that especially mean the most to me. So I know that if she says something like, if I'm sending, talking about parenting, yeah. I know I type S-I-V-E dot R-S slash P-A, send, uh, is my article on parenting. The P-A yeah. I know is, so I made it that way on purpose so yeah. that it, and, uh, and so she laughs that like, she'll ask me some random question by text and I'll answer with a URL and she'll always reply with a little, you know, ha ha, of course you have a website about, or a, a, of course you have an article about that already. Yeah. Um, so. Book list. My book list, it is the best answer to, um, I could tell you two books right now, but it yeah. would be like... I want to know your favorite. Do oh, you have a favorite? Well, the one that changed my life the most was Awaken the Giant Within, mm. but that's because I was 19. Yeah. And I wouldn't say it's a great book. When I reread it last year, I was like, ooh, mm. wow. Um, incredibly verbose. It's like mm. 700 pages or something, but yeah. there's a lot of good shit in it. Um, but, like, when I, years ago when I met Tim Ferriss for the first time, I told him I loved that book, and he went, huh. He said, I read that book, it did nothing for me. He said, the book I loved was The Magic of Thinking Big. Yeah, I love that book. And so, but I read The Magic of Thinking yeah. Big, and I went, huh. Oh, I love that It did book. nothing for me. Yeah. But, but I thought it was maybe it's because I've already read enough books that were similar to it. Yeah. And then, so it's really interesting, the, the, um, the order that you read in makes a big difference. Mm. So... I read a fascinating book called Stumbling on Happiness. Yeah. I loved it so much that I read another book about happiness called The How of Happiness by Sonia Lomborski, and I loved that one. And then I read a third book on happiness that everybody was raving about, and I was like, eh. And it's because it was covering the same stuff I just yeah. read in the other. But if I had read them in the other order, Could then the different. book that I went, yeah. eh, would have been my favorite. Yeah. And the book that was my favorite would have been the, eh. Yeah. So that's why I feel weird about saying like, okay, everybody, yeah. here's what you need to it's read. totally at the time. Yeah. I took a month off over Christmas, mm -hmm. which was glorious. And I read, I'm going to get the title wrong, Benjamin Hardy. It's like, be your future you now or yeah. future you now or yeah. be your future self now. Something like it's that. It's one of those titles. Um and it was, I was like, this is the best book I've read in a long time. But after I was like, it is a brilliant book, but it was the brilliant book that I wanted to read right mm. at that time. Right, yeah. Yeah. And had I read it when I was in like hectic day-to-day -day life, I don't think it would have had the same. Right. Yeah. Same with your book. I picked up Anything You Want. A friend of mine had recommended it and I picked it up on, on the airplane mm -hmm. and went on, read it on the plane and just read it and read it again and sat there staring out the window, looking at the clouds going... Huh. Huh. Thinking about all the things, which I think would have been different had mm. I not actually had my head up above the cloud. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. It's there's yeah, it's different books for different yeah. chapters in your life. So yeah. I mean my best advice for books, instead of having somebody say, These are the two best books you should read, mm. my best advice is to Get a collection, whether you just put them into a, like an Amazon wish list or you just go buy the paper books and keep them stacked up. The book you need next can sometimes be like almost down to the hour that there can be a certain book that you need right now that you're hitting a real frustration or you're trying to make mm -hmm. a big decision and you think, you know what I need right now? I need to lay on the sofa for two hours with a book about decision making mm. right now. That's what I need right now. Or, you, you know, you asked about the stopping thinking. Yeah. I just want to lay down and read a book about Chinese culture right now. Yeah. <laughs> just to get my head out of the other thing I've been doing. Yeah. Do you so, read a lot of fiction? No. No? I, I watch a lot of movies. Yeah, so to okay. me, my fic uh, yeah. movies are my fiction yeah. format. Um, books are my only non-fiction format. I, 
I don't yeah. like podcasts. I don't interesting like videos um, because for both of those, um, I hear these brilliant ideas and then they just kind of like keep going yeah. in the stream of time and going, yeah. ah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, I'm on this walk in the forest and yeah. I, I, I know I, I heard I did that like... last weekend. Okay. I was listening to a podcast episode and it was uh. so good mm -hmm. that I had to sit down and then I okay. had to, I went across to the cafe and got some paper and a pencil right. and then I just sat there and listened to the rest of it without walking. Yeah. Because I was doing a walk. Exactly. And I was like <laughs> sitting there listening to it. I'm like, I almost need, this is like a classroom yeah. situation. It was such a good episode. Do you remember what it was? Uh, yeah, it was your friend, Tim Ferriss, mm -hmm. interviewing the Netflix CTO. Okay, okay. It's amazing. I haven't yeah. heard that one. Yeah. Um, but that's my problem with... Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I listened to, to Tim's interviewing the Spotify person straight after. It okay. was the Lenny podcast oh. interviewing the Netflix CTO. Okay. Yeah. Lenny. I'd um, never heard of it before. A friend of mine sent the episode huh. and I was like, because I'm trying to be a better leader at the moment okay. to learn to manage people. And, and she was amazing. Cool. And I needed to take many notes. You know, not that anybody needs to hear this from me, but I think whatever format works best for people, yeah. you shouldn't think that you should use some other format because other people are. Yeah. If you just love short form videos and that's how you learn, yeah. And if that works for you, then don't think that you're supposed to be reading books. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm a bad person because I'm not, I don't read books. It's like, well, if it doesn't work for you, yeah, talk about yeah. actions revealing your values. Yeah. If you just don't want to read books yeah. and you think like, ugh, I should read a book, then just don't. Just go with whatever yeah. is working for you. You know. I've, to me, laying down or sitting down and reading a book is like the most indulgent, decadent, yeah, delicious same. thing. That's why I was so surprised you don't have a bookshelf. Yeah. To me, like a tablet is not the same as picking up a book and the smell of it and the feel <laughs> of it and writing Good. notes in there and, and the back pages I write all my thoughts and yeah. I love them. See, yeah. my system is in my ebook reader. Yeah. I have a thing where every time I read an interesting idea, I hold my finger down on it. I drag over this, the idea I liked and when I let go, it creates a highlight. When I'm done reading the book, I connect a USB cable. It just I, has and all the highlights. It connects the highlights. And then I, then I go through those highlights and I yeah. put them into my own words. And then now they're in a system in text files that I review often. I come back to this often. They're all searchable by yeah. word or phrase or date. Um, so I can say, show me all the books that mention commitment. Oh, that would be cool. Um, that's why I love digital and yeah. why I love my text files. I said, this idea of like, I do that with my diary too. Yeah. Um, show me, uh, show me all of my thoughts on, uh, Erica, yeah. the week we met, yeah. uh, and bloop, there it is right away. I don't have wow. to, bloop, 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 you know. Erica is your ex-wife? No. No? <laughs> Who's Erica? Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Actually, you want to know, uh, one of my favorite people I've ever met, maybe even my hero, um, Erica LeMay, E-R-I-K-A-L-E-M-A-Y dot com. <laughs> you could see her. I will. <laughs> uh, she is a, uh, an aerial artist uh, that I got to know in 2017. Oh, cool. And uh, is just one of my favorite people on earth. Um, yeah, she's, she's, she's a superhero. I love that. Uh, yeah, she's like a living superhero. She's yeah. like, like the... Uh, Nietzsche talks about the Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. it's like that she's living it. She's amazing. Nice. Um, Favorite show you've recently watched? We know it's not reality TV. Do you watch TV? Don't. Just movies. Just movies. Um, I will translate your word "show" to mean movie. Mm. Poor uh, things. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's my that's my candidate. Yeah. Um, Different people take different things out of this movie. Yeah. Um, is it dark? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's probably not for me. <laughs> but Bella, the main character that Emma Stone plays, yeah. I saw as a wonderful role model of learning. She, the movie starts when she's basically uh, a day old um, and you watch her learn. Wow. And become sophisticated and go from yeah. having idea. the men mentality of a one day old in into being really sophisticated. But but it happens quickly. Yeah. Um, 
And all right, I, no, no, I was about to. I can't wreck the spoiler. Okay. To but other people say, oh yeah, Poor Things was a brilliant metaphor of how women are treated in the media, as how they're infantilized. Is that mm. how we pronounce it? Yeah. Right? Um, uh, by some and respected by others until they prove themselves like, whoa, I didn't get that r- reading, wow. So it's it's one of those movies that can mean different things to different people, but yeah, I, I saw it in the cinema in New Zealand, I just walked out just like, whoa, I like thought about it for days. Like, I kind of want to have like oh, a little like like that. Bella action figure on my desk, which is just that like, good. I just like, I, yeah, her character was really okay. inspiring to I me. I might try the dark. Um, oh, is there a question that you ask people to get to know them without too much small talk? That was a good one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Thanks. um, Because you don't strike me as like much of a small talky guy. I can. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's. I'm not good at small talk. Well, my friend Tynan came to visit from America. He came to visit me in Wellington. I think he was just passing through for a day or two. And uh, Tynan calls himself an extrovert. And I've always called myself an introvert. We hung out for like three or four hours where he met me at my apartment in central Wellington and we walked around for a bit and met up somewhere and then like went back to my house. To, that's it. We just kind of went out to get something to eat and then we came back to my apartment. And as we came back to my apartment, he goes, I think you just talked to more people in the last hour than I've talked with in weeks. I went, really? And he goes, Dude, you talk with everyone everywhere you go. And, huh, I guess so. Like, yeah, I think I just, I kind of make chit chat with the people around me. I think, like, yeah, I talk to strangers with cute dogs. I talk to <laughs> uh, just people I meet. Yeah, so I, so I might be more of an extrovert than I um, realized. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with small talk. Oh, yeah. so your real question. Um, Do you have a question that you ask people or no? Not a set one. No. You know what this reminds me of is um, years ago a friend of mine who was dating yeah. said, what is your sense of humor? I said, what? She said, well, how would you categorize your sense of humor? Yeah. She says, because I met this guy that said that, that he asked me that question, to, wanted to get to know what my sense of humor was. And he said that his sense of humor is sarcastic and he wanted to know which of the five categories my sense of humor was in. Was he being sarcastic when he said No. That? <laughs> <laughs> he was trying to get to know her quickly on a first date. <laughs> and I said, I don't like this question because it assumes that your sense of humor is the same no matter where you go or who you're talking yeah. to. But to me, the whole thing about humor is it's like, it's kind of responsive. Yeah. It plays off the scenario. If you just... just barged your way through life with the same sense mm. of humor no matter what the scenario was in you would not be very funny yeah uh and so i think it's maybe the same thing with um conversation yeah that there's some people that um asking a get to know you quick question mm. would be a horrible way to get to know them yeah uh, you, like you'd have embarrassingly to. so my sense of humor is I laugh when I get videos of people hurting themselves. All right. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Did you ever watch Jackass? I, not for a long time, I haven't. Okay. But okay. literally, like I think my husband and I, our main form of communication is him sending me videos that he knows will make me crack up. And I try not to laugh because I know it's awful. P- people like accidentally getting hurt. like slipping Yeah, like when they slip over, when they're like, you know, walking down a street, looking at something, playing on their phone, and then they hit their head on a post. <laughs> I love it. The, I dogs, want, when, when uh, dogs slip up. I have three dogs. I love mm-hmm. dogs. But when dogs do funny things, mm-hmm. oh, my gosh. I think one of the funniest videos, I, I think I've <laughs> laughed harder than I've ever laughed at one video was, it's an old one that's probably been around for like 15 or maybe even 20 years now, of a guy that is so drunk. He's, he's it's like a, a um, the security camera captured this. Yeah. He's in like a supermarket or whatever and he's so drunk that he can't get himself to open the cabin he's like trying to yeah, i'd love that and then he like falls over backwards <laughs> and it's, it's like seriously it's like two minutes of him trying to get up and he can't <laughs> remember how to stand up but he yeah. keeps trying and that's I, my sense of humor. i was just like yeah. cheering and crying and laughing at this yeah. and like a uh a, a more sensitive friend of mine was yeah. standing there just going like 
It's horrible. Yeah. How could you find this funny? I know. That poor man. I know. I was like, it's fucking hilarious. I know. I know. Because at one point he does stand up and then he's like, he's like, <clears throat> he tries to get it he together it. and he collapses into the bag <laughs> of chips. And oh god. Yeah. I gotta. I should just download that. Um, there's a great little script that you can do. You use Mac or Windows? Mac. Uh. uh I told you I'm cliche. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that when we you were. Did, you recording. didn't add that in your list yeah, of cliche I items. Didn't. But um, the uh, there's something called YT DLP. I don't even know what the DLP stands for, yeah. but the YT stands for YouTube. YT DLP. Mm -hmm. You can use it to download any YouTube video, so you can just keep a local copy. So if there's something you're going to watch again and again and again and again and again, yeah. uh, you don't have to keep watching all the ads every time. You can just own the little MP4 video file. So that's what I do for like my favorite videos of all time. So I should go find that video again. Yeah. I hadn't thought about it. I'll in see if I time. can find it. Okay, last question. With such few things that you own as a minimalist, is there one product that you have that you can't live without? Hmm. Okay, well, well assuming you don't mean can't live without literally. Not like an essential like your toothbrush. No. Like, I mean, something you don't need. I'll, I'll, I'll distinguish it with that. Right. A product you don't need for everyday life. Do you have one? I have a really nice keyboard that I find makes a massive difference in my happiness. So, um, so I have two computers. I have a desktop and a laptop. Yeah. So, like, when I'm out on a trip like this, I'll bring my laptop with me. Um... When I'm at home, everything else I do is on my desktop. And for the desktop, I just, a couple years ago, uh, got a mechanical keyboard from a Chinese company. I forget the name of it. It's actually on my, I have a user's page. So it's on my website yeah. somewhere. Um, of course, I know the URL. Yes. S-I-V-E dot R-S slash U-S-E-S uses. It's a user's Like Derek page. uses this. Yeah, that's what Derek uses. It's actually a common thing. A lot of people with personal websites. Yeah. It's kind of like how many sites have a slash about. Yeah, mine's tools. But there users you go. is way okay. cooler. Well, I think users, yeah. I actually probably would have chosen tools too, but users has become a bit of the norm. So in this case, I just went for the norm. Yeah. Um, do you have a now page? Now page? No. You need What's a now, a now page? page? It's the page that like says... Like what I'm working on now? Uh-huh. Oh, I like that. Because social media doesn't cover that. Like, yeah. if I were to tune into your feeds right now, I might kind of see what's yeah, kind yeah, of interesting, yeah. but it wouldn't give me the gist... Like what you're reading and what you're thinking yeah. about. It's, yeah, it's like what that. you would tell an old friend that you haven't seen in too long. Ah. And if they were to say, like, what's been up with you? What you been yeah. doing? It would be the like the one page it kind of says, like, my kids are 15 and 16. Yeah. It, this one's really into golf. I've been working on this. Yeah. Um, uh, you know... I like it's, that. It's the overview. I'm going to make an hour right we, we've now. We've been page. at this home for three years. We're planning on staying. Um, yeah, so the, the slash now. Yeah. And then um, if you do that, then email it to me. And yeah. I have a website called nownownow.com where I collect all the now pages from. So they're like 2,000, maybe 2,500 personal pages where people yeah. have created a now page on their site. So, so nice. I put that on nownownow.com. Yeah, okay. Um, so anyway, your this, product, your keyboard. This keyboard with, it's called Midnight Silent Switches. So it's like, ah, oh, it just feels so nice. I just know something. My fingers don't want to stop typing. When I'm <laughs> typing on it, I just like keep, oh, it feels so good to keep writing. Because it's, it's like, smooth or because it clicks? It's, no, because it doesn't click so much. Yeah, okay. It's a, I used to have I a click, 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 Yeah, I yeah. used to have one of those and it physically felt nice, but I, I, I'm I, not a uh, abrasive person. Yeah. I don't like to be loud. Yeah. So I found that I was actually subconsciously typing less because uh. I didn't want to yeah. create a racket yeah, nice. in the house. So uh, that's why I bought the silent switches. And I just yeah. noticed like, God, it's yeah. like, I mean, look, there are things like, I love good black tea. Mm. When I drink good black tea, almost everyone's like, oh God, I just like, oh man, this is good. The, the, the way that people are with their like, their morning coffee, that's how I'm with yeah. like good black tea, but even not in the morning, just always, I love my <laughs> wonderful black tea. But, um, but when I type on this keyboard, it's a little bit like that, like, God, I love this keyboard. God, it feels good. So. I'd, I'd just give that as my weird item. Um, There's things you're attached to. If you moved, yeah. would you take it with you? Yeah. 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 That's See, there is a good question. Yeah. All right, Mr. Minimalist, if yeah. you were to move with one suitcase, what, would you, what would you take? Yeah. Then the other thing would be my um, Berkey water filter. 
I yeah. got it when yeah I, you know, when I moved to England. You know how they have have water you spent filters. time over there where they have the hard water? Yeah. Yeah. If you try yeah. to make tea, not a in long England, time, but yeah, it it's, it has a film on top. Yeah. So I got it because of that. Yeah. And and um, so that would be on my short list. I, I mean, would... even America. Really? Yeah, water that comes out of the tap there's real weird. I mean, oh, if, yeah. from New Zealand water to American water. Right. I, I went one direction. I didn't. Yeah. Uh, you I haven't been back? back. Not really. Really. I, I left in 2010. I've been back a few days since. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. When's your next trip back? Don't have Maybe one planned. Maybe never. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. They're, they're just, they're like, there's a, there's a burrito place that I would miss but, uh, <laughs> if I never went to America again. But, you know, other than that, I'd be all right. Yeah, amazing. It's, it's just there's so many other places I want to go on Earth, you know. Yeah. It's like, if, do you keep track of how many countries you visited? I do. I haven't counted, but I have a file. I thought I should start doing this before it gets too late. Yeah. Starting about 15 years ago, I, my file is the year and the country that I've first entered on that year. Yeah. So like if I go back to a country multiple times, it still only appears once in the list. But I try to remember the year that I first went to a country. And uh, so like last year I went to Cyprus and, for the very first time. Yeah. But I also went to Israel, but I had been there once before in 2004. So Israel it's did not get added. To, yeah. yeah. So it's still up there in 2004. But last year was Cyprus and United Arab Emirates and Oman for the first time. Um, I love that. Um, well, that is all of the questions that no, I have for now. No, that's everything. I'm like, I can, you know everything about me now. I can. There's many more I could ask you for the rest of the day, but I am conscious that I have taken a lot of your time. I appreciate it so much. Thank you so, so much. I know that you get a lot of offers, and this one you would have gone, who is this person? And you said yes, which made my... I was going to say made my day. It made more than my day. <laughs> um, it made my hour. It made that my it. hour. It, it made my day. It. it made my week. But it's also, you know, it's it's pivotal in that you were the, the first one on that Dream 100 list. Mm -hmm. And now I will try and do more interesting conversations with interesting people because I really appreciate it and sharing your thoughts and hopefully everyone being able to question some of the beliefs that we hold as well as, you know, me selfishly asking a lot of questions that I wanted to know. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, let's. I'll get Celine in next. I think she's waiting outside for, <laughs> since we've got the nice <laughs> I love studio her set up. So much. Um, but yeah, I've never. No, no, I shouldn't say never done this, but this thing with the lights and three cameras. I know. Um, cool, right? I haven't done this in. Uh, this is really, really rare and wonderful oh, to do this. Well, so thank, thank you for you. this fancy setup. Well, I mean, the, this was also, yeah, Dan was asking me, like, how, how far through the podcast you are. And I'm like, this is episode 260-something-ish. Uh, it was like, oh, wow. So you're used to this? I'm like, this is the first time I've done this. Cool. I have never done this, but you're Derek Sivers. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going to bring my little cannon and set us <laughs> up on our road mics and be like, right. I hope the sound works. Yeah. Yeah. This is why this. So thank you. I, I've been standing in my... <laughs> sound booth in Wellington a Long lot time. and so it's really sweet to uh yeah it's much better yeah yeah thank you thanks everybody